So to start with, that picture at the front there is when I first moved to the United States, I actually lived down in Florida for eight years and I worked with Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission actually as part of my University of Florida appointment and I was working with manatees and so within that ring there, that's a net. This is us up in the panhandle of Florida in the middle of winter. I, um, that's me on the back of the boat there. It's quite cold, it's probably realistically in about the 40s degrees and what ends up happening is, is that when water drops below 68 degrees Fahrenheit, a lot of mammalian species, particularly manatees, end up getting cold stress. And so the manatee which is sitting inside of this net had wandered his way up into the panhandle during this cold period and was at risk of suffering cold stress. So we actually had to go up and rescue him and relocate him. The reason why we knew he was up there is because that thing bobbing there is actually a radio tracker collar that's on him. That manatee is Harold. Harold had been tracked by USGS for a number of years. He'd been tracked out to Bermuda and they had to go and rescue him from there. They had to do that twice because unlike a, um, dugongs which can live their entire life in marine environments, manatees actually require a freshwater period throughout their life cycle, throughout each year. Bermuda doesn't supply any major fresh water, so they actually had to go and bring him back. So this single individual manatee, and this took us about two days to actually get up there and catch him. So this single individual manatee ended up costing you know, the federal government tens of thousands of dollars to actually rescue. So what do you think USGS did after we rescued him? They took off his radio collar. <laughs> so Harold was on his own. As far as I know, Harold is still doing fine. Okay? <laughs> but we're not tracking him anymore. We're not responsible for going overseas and actually bringing him back. So. Anyway, that's that picture. So as I've already said, what I really want to talk about today is get you to know what the idea of fish health is, link the importance of fish health and production success, and then come up with the idea of what the basic elements to look for with your fish are. So a lot of this should be basic, a lot of this you should know, but I'm just hopefully trying to put it into context. And then the rest of the day, so the stuff that you hear from Matt and the stuff that you'll hear from Stephen Reichley, and we'll just sort of be reinforcing that and going into it in greater detail and then also showing it to you sort of practically over in the necropsy. So we're going to sort of start talking about the major elements of how to tell if your fish is sick. So we're going to look at clinical signs and then sort of briefly touch on some of the possible causes. And as I said, I'm going to sort of bring in aquaculture, public aquaria, pets and wildlife sort of as illustrative examples. So. The first thing is, and this is sort of something to think about as Ohio gets more into its aquaponics and all of that sort of stuff, that when we talk about aquatic animals, we're not just talking about a single species of fish. So this monoculture of a single species. Aquatic animals, by definition, really covers any life stage. So whether that's gametes, eggs, fry, adults, of fish, mollusks, crustaceans, amphibians, and reptiles, taken from the wild or produced in captivity for farming, release, human consumption, or ornamental display. That covers pretty much everything, doesn't it? So really, as far as being an aquatic animal health veterinarian goes, any day that I'm working in an aquarium, I can be dealing with anything from an invertebrate. So, you know, people come and tell me that their starfish are melting through to dealing with sharks. You know, we used to, down in Florida Aquarium where I was, we used to have sand tiger sharks through to actually going out and doing conservation medicine and then also dealing with like things like the alligators and that that they actually had on site. So we sort of got this wide expanse of what we're doing. So aquatic animal health, from the medicine point of view, from our point of view as vets supporting you, as well as your point of view as producers, it's the condition and treatment of any of the above aquatic animals to control and prevent disease. And throughout today, I think probably one of the main things we're gonna be trying to drive home is really prevention is way better than trying to control any problems that you have. And so we're going to go through steps of how to actually try and prevent things and the best things we can do to make sure we don't have to deal with disease in the first place. So these are some of the alligators that I actually deal with down in Florida. This is not the main farm that I was just telling you about before. It's a different farm. Those guys there are about a year old. And so a, um, I think alligators are a cool industry to work with. So like I used to work with crocs and I got into working with crocs on the production side, but I actually started working with crocs out in the wild. And so we used to do that as part of a control measure. I used to work with indigenous communities up in the very northern part of Australia, so up in those little islands just south of Indonesia. 
and you know crocodiles were a significant thing like you'd literally drive around the islands and they'd have killing stations where they bring in sea turtles and dugongs and eat them as part of their indigenous subsistence harvest and there'd be crocodiles just sort of sitting offshore like literally 50 80 feet offshore sort of thing and the main difference between a crocodile and an alligator is, is that crocodiles are aggressive. An Australian saltwater crocodile will actively come after you, whereas an alligator will do pretty much everything in its power to avoid you until the last minute. So working up with crocs was always a challenge and always good fun. And then coming here and getting the opportunity to work with alligators was just awesome because it's kind of like the puppy dogs of the crocodilian world. So. The cool thing I think about alligators are is that they're the perfect conservation success story. So back in 1973 when the Endangered Species Act came into play, they were one of the first 10 species put on the Endangered Species Act, the American alligator. So it was in imminent risk of going extinct. Now we've got hundreds of farms throughout the US. We farm literally hundreds of thousands of them. Every single alligator that's farmed in the United States is actually has its egg harvested from the wild. We do not produce a, um, eggs on farm, unlike Australia where 50% of the crocodile farms, until it got non-viable to do it, used to produce eggs on farm themselves and then they go out and harvest the rest of the eggs. But then the egg cost got down to like $9 an egg and you only paid $9 for that egg if it was a successful hatch. So it suddenly wasn't worth actually trying to keep crocodiles on farm year around to breed when you could go out and just spend nine bucks and get it. Versus every single egg that you get for an American alligator costs you, cost this year, $70, whether it lived or didn't live. So the moment you touch that egg, you paid $70 for it. So anyway, we harvest these eggs from the wild. We I, um, hatch them out on farm. We grow them out for about three years if we're aiming for a six foot alligator, which produces a 30 something centimeter a um, hide, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Um, what we're also doing though is part of the money that comes from those eggs goes back towards conservation of species, but also it's also controlling the population. Because we've so successfully recovered the population, we've actually got them to the point that we're going out and we're doing active control programs to remove them from the wild so they don't turn into being a pest species. So from a production point of view, they're actually a real cool success story. Okay. Whenever we're dealing with aquatic animal health, what we're really coming down to, and this is sort of the, my mindset of always thinking about it, and hopefully, you know, if you guys are getting into aquaculture and you come from different production backgrounds, is a good way to think of it, is we're really just dealing with wet herd health. A lot of the things we're doing, it's really, we're going into the water, but otherwise we could be dealing with a pig farm, we could be dealing with cattle, we could be dealing with sheep. This sort of basic concepts of you don't treat the individuals, you're treating the entire herd. Thinking of trying to put in preventative measures as opposed to reactive measures. You're not waiting for your fish to start dying. You're actually going in there and trying to create the perfect environment for them, which is going to minimize the risks of them dying. Is it really exactly the same as if you called me up and turned around and said, I've got 100 beef cattle sitting out on 200 acres. How are we going to control this? So. Part of the reason why we do this at the population level is it's just plain and simply not economically viable to deal with individuals. Okay, we're dealing with such small margins here, particularly when we're competing against overseas markets which can import you know, for basically pennies on the dollar sort of thing. There's not huge levels of money to sort of sit there and go, hey, this fish looks sick, I'm going to call the vet in, because I know vets aren't cheap. Okay? It's not something that you can just turn around and bring the bed in twice a week. It's something that you basically use the vet as the last resort. So um, it's just not economically viable to look at individuals. And also the other thing to think about is if you've got one or two fish swimming around in your tank and they don't look right, chances are it's affecting all of them. It's not just those one or two animals. All right. But the good thing is, is that as opposed to the way a lot of veterinary medicine was 20, 30, 40 years ago, the way we are now is, is that with accurate diagnosis for a lot of these fish problems or aquatic animal problems, the treatments and the prevention programs that we use are usually pretty successful. So it's not a, if something happens, we're in trouble, we've just lost our entire stock sort of thing. But whether we're talking about single animal or whether we're talking about 10 acre ponds, you know, the best form of control is prevention. So why is aquaculture becoming more and more important? Well, you guys know all of this. It's really that it's no longer 
viable to keep harvesting from a, um, the wild. So in the case of alligators, where we're actually harvesting to control the population, that's a good thing. But I always remember as a kid learning big fish industry where we grew up, where I grew up in Australia was Orange Ruffy. And it used to be known, when I first went through university, it used to be known that Orange Ruffy had a life cycle of nine years. And so we went out and they harvested and they set quotas all based on those nine years. By the time I'd finished university, that actually worked out that the Orange Ruffy life cycle was actually 70 years. And so we'd been harvesting at well over seven times the rate which we actually had. And we pretty much decimated the Orange Ruffy industry in, this is northern Tasmania, so the southern part of Australia. We decimated it. So, um, it's no longer viable for us to feed the number of people we've got in the world or based on our current knowledge a lot of the biology is to keep harvesting at the rate we're doing. So wild harvest is decreasing. Aquaculture production is going up and it's continuing to go up and Matt's got some really cool um, graphs. I assume you're giving that talk. <coughs> Matt, Matt can tell you about some really cool <laughs> graphs that he's got in another talk that he's not giving today. <laughs> basically the same exact spiel yesterday to aquatic veterinarians or veterinarians and uh, vet students uh, right next door. So we spent it all day with the vet students where I did talk about a bunch of pretty graphs, so we're shifting gears a little bit. But. The important bit about those pretty graphs, though, is, is that the protein levels produced by aquaculture is required to actually meet global protein demands. So we really do need aquaculture as part of a viable industry. So it's not about to go away. It's not increasing at the same rate it was a decade ago, but it's still increasing. So demand is high, but what we need to do is you know, streamline what we're doing and be more efficient. And we need to be competitive. There are lots of people getting into aquaculture, and Ohio is a great example of a place with a huge amount of potential that needs more people in aquaculture versus places over, in, in, for example, like in Asia, where Aquaculture has been established for a long time. They produce at you know, mass volumes at really low costs. But we need to be competitive to compete against them. And we also need to produce something which is high quality. And I guess to give a quick example of that, this is about a 12 to 18 month old um, alligator. The important part of an alligator is this part of it here, that part of its hide. 96% of the money that comes from the alligator actually comes from that part of its hide. 4% of it actually comes from the meat. So the meat is really just a salvage procedure at best. This is the important bit. Now you think about an alligator will end up being worth, probably one brought to about six foot is probably worth about $600. What they're looking at doing is extending the industry out to try and get them to five years old, which is about seven and a half, eight foot, or the magical 40 centimeter um, across here part for the hide and that will make that animal worth closer to $1,000. So they're animals which are worth a lot of money. This part is really important, and therefore any abnormalities or blemishes within this part either makes it a non-viable hide or reduces its value. And so one of the biggest problems we're dealing with in the industry is this umbilical scarring. And what it is is alligators are reptiles. They've got these yolk sacs which sit inside them. They've usually got about 10 days to two weeks to actually come out of their egg, emerge out of the nest, which happens four or five days after they come out of the egg, go and find a food source and start eating. What happens in industry is, is that the second they start hatching, we used to turn around and go, awesome, let's get this guy out. Let's get him on food. Let's start getting him to eat, because the sooner he starts eating, the sooner he's going to start growing. The quicker he actually grows, the quicker we're going to get to our size, so we're putting in less money to get our product. Then we'll send him off and we'll get our, a, um, our hide out of him. But the problem was, it wasn't allowing that yolk sac to actually be used up. And so what we're getting is, we're getting food starting to come into his stomach, expanding out his little stomach and his little abdomen here, and this bit of tissue here, which is really soft umbilicus, which looks exactly the same as the umbilical cords in your kids when they were born, it's that sort of really gentle tissue, would get stretched, and we'd end up getting a scar. And anything over three-eighths of an inch actually makes that AM hide non-viable. So it'll get downgraded or it'll actually get rejected. And so what ends up happening with a guy like this who's got this umbilical scar, which is the single biggest cause of a um, loss of income for the alligator industry, is, is that we go from having a hide which is this big to only be able to get watch straps out of it on either side. And watch straps are literally pennies to the dollar sort of thing as far as value goes. 
So there's an important need for us to actually have high quality, consistent products. So okay, so the types of diseases that we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about infectious diseases. So things like parasites, bacteria, virus, and fungus. And Dr. Reikley is going to go into these in more detail this afternoon, so I'm not going to drill into them. I'm just going to basically mention that they exist and sort of show some of the signs for them. And then we'll also talk about non-infectious diseases, so environmental problems, nutritional problems, and genetic problems. So the most common presentations you actually see in your fish is dead. Basically turn up in the morning and there's a bunch of dead fish sitting at the top of the tank or worse than that, sitting down the bottom of the tank trying to go through the filters. They have excess mucus on them, which is usually a sign of stress of some sort, whether it's either an environmental stress or whether it's an a, um, infectious stress. They're bloated or they're floating around. They have raised scales, which is really like dropsy, I am so an ascites, so they bloat up with fluid, what's the most common cause to it. What actually causes the scales to come up is the little pockets underneath the scale gets filled up with fluid, but it makes them look like a pine cone fish. They, um, they get lesions or erythema, and lesions are basically any sorts of trauma or damage to what we see on the outside of the skin. And they also get things like gas bubbles, so if you've got supersaturation of your oxygen, they end up getting gas bubbles in the eyes, or they're fluffy and wormy. Now when you think about it, from a clinical diagnostic point of view, that's really not a whole bunch of clinical signs to go on. You know, you phone me up and you turn around and say, my fish has lesions and 10% of the tank's dead. If you brought your cat into me and you turn around and you said, Here's my cat, I'm not going to let you touch it, but he's got a red patch of skin here, what's wrong with him? You know, the chance of me being able to turn around and tell you what that actually is is pretty close to zero. And unfortunately with things like fish and a lot of aquatic animals, they don't show a huge amount of clinical signs. So being able to look at them at a distance and go, I can tell you that's that disease, is either based on me being really, really, really experienced or really, really, really lucky. It actually isn't based on diagnosis. And so what we need to do is we need to sort of think in terms of when we see these signs, they contribute to telling us what potentially can be going on. But what we really need to do is be able to collect these animals, send them into diagnostic labs and find out what's actually going on properly. And so part of what I'm going to talk about today is how we can collect samples to send into diagnostic labs, but also so how you guys on farm can collect a little bit more information so that when you are talking to Matt or a, I'm calling me up or Day I'm coming into the diagnostic labs, you can give everyone a head start on what's potentially going on with the problems. Okay. <clears throat> so as far as initial on-farm diagnostics goes, there's distance exam, and distance exam translates across all species. So if you've ever dealt with cattle or sheep or whatever, the first thing your vet does when you get him out is he stands at the gate and he spends the first five minutes, or he should spend the first five minutes, watching the animals walking around, seeing what's going on, seeing who's not part of the herd, seeing who's limping, you know, seeing who's bloated, all of that sort of stuff. We do exactly the same thing with fish if we're dealing with a tank. The first thing you should do is, is that you just spend a few minutes each morning looking at your pond or looking at your tanks and seeing what's abnormal, who's not acting normally. Okay. Next thing is things like water quality. You know, it's the most important thing that you're actually going to deal with. It's the biggest challenge that you always deal with. For me, as a vet, water quality scares the living daylights out of me. And I've always, when I worked in the aquarium, I always relied on my biologist to be able to do it. When I do research now I, um, on animals, I work with aquarists up at Columba Zoo. It's them that I require, rely on to be able to get the water quality. I know I can't keep a goldfish alive. Okay, it really needs for me to be people who know what they're talking about with water quality, but it's so important. I know that I suck at it and I know that I shouldn't be the person allowed to do it. So we'll talk about doing skin, fin and gills. We'll talk about response to treatment. Um, we'll talk about environments and then we'll quickly go over some biosecurity husbandry stuff. So with your distance exam, it's like what we were saying before, there's only so many things that you're actually going to be able to see, but they can actually start to help you direct you towards a diagnosis. You're either going to walk in and you're going to see your fish dead. Okay? They're floating. They can be piping. Does everyone know what piping is? Do you know what causes piping? Lack of oxygen. You know, it's a really good start, isn't it? If you've got fish piping, that sort of narrows down your potential causes a huge amount. Spinning, 
know what causes spinning? Yep, whirling disease, and what causes whirling disease? Yeah, you can get scoliosis, you can get parasites which irritate them, you can get neurological stuff which is going on, which is actually causing them to basically go crazy. So, but it's a good thing to limit down. It's suddenly removed from us, you know, a whole bunch of other differentials. If they're darting around, they can be irritated, or if they're lethargic, they're sitting on the bottom of the tank, sort of barely gaping sort of thing. So yeah, they're just the sorts of things that you can observe without actually having to get your hands wet, without having to go anywhere near the tank. Thing I always got taught, the three most important things in aquatic animal health is water, water, and water. And that's you know, predominantly your ammonia, your dissolved oxygen levels, pH, hardness, carbon dioxide, alkalinity, temperature, nitrates, and organic loads. I'm not gonna go into detail for them, and I've deliberately stuck something up there which actually isn't really relevant. This is a reef aquarium water parameters. The reason why I've stuck reef aquarium stuff up there is, is that because every single, firstly, freshwater and salt water are completely different systems. Secondly, every single tank that you're gonna deal with is different. I don't know, when I worked at the aquarium, I didn't know what the water quality parameters were of the tanks. My biologists did. They were the ones that would come to me and turn around and say, pH is out by 0.2. Is it up or down? It's down, okay. I didn't know that the pH in that tank was meant to be 6.8, but I down know it's 6.6. I know it's getting more acidic. I know there's something I should probably do about it, and I start thinking in those terms. You guys have the advantage in that you probably know water quality way better than I ever will. And so knowing what each tank's parameters are, you know, I know that tank runs a little bit alkaline. I know this tank has problems with oxygen. You know, those sorts of things can actually really start to help you identify what's going on. Water is also then very much influenced by the filtration system and the sort of movement that you've actually got going through your tanks. And we'll talk a little bit more about filters a bit later and pump systems, but they're vitally important to the um, health of your animals. So Dr. Reikley is going to show you how to do um, skin and gill clips or skin scrapes and gill clips um, during the necropsy. I think there's something that's really important to, even if you're not comfortable doing them, at least know what they are, how they can be done, and the sort of information that they can yield. If that's the sort of thing that you're actually comfortable doing, and even if it's just a skin and a, a um, fin scrape, which we'll talk about in a sec, I think that can really help you towards diagnosis. And I know in last year's boot camp, I talked about this, and a few guys actually went out and looked at getting microscopes to be able to just physically be able to collect these samples, look down the scope, at their fish and it would really just help them, if nothing else, to be able to eliminate or identify potentially if they've got parasites in their fish. Okay, so the idea of skin, fin and gills, it's kind of like the very first diagnostics I do whenever I'm dealing with fish species and it's simple. And Dr. Reich is going to show you how to do it, but you're going to need a simple microscope and a microscope these days you can get from Amscope. I've got them for my students, I bought them for they were like 120 bucks each. They're awesome. They're diagnostic microscopes that my vet students can use and get diagnoses out of. They come with warranties. They come with full support, that sort of stuff. That you know, They're not these expensive, go and invest $1,000 in a microscope anymore. But you need a microscope, you need some slides, and you need some cover slips, and you need the water out of the tank that you're looking at the fish in and a pair of scissors if you're going to do a um, gill clips, which Dr. Reichler will show you, but even if you don't do them. What you do is you get the fish, you take a scrape either along its lateral line or along its belly and a, um, or underneath its a, um, pectoral fin. That gives you the mucus off the fish. You then take a drop of water, you put it onto your slide, you put your cover slip on top of it and then you can go and look for parasites. You can look for a, um, whether there's little squiggly things going on there. You can look to see if there's you know, big pits of a, um, skin coming off with it, so you've got some sort of erythema going on, or whether you've got blood in there. So it just helps you get an idea of some of those clinical signs that we talked about before. With a, um, the gills, you can either take a clip off the gills, and you can have a look at that under the microscope, and that tells you whether there's parasites. It tells you from the colour of the gills as to whether they're getting oxygen or whether there's too much nitrogen there, and can just give you an idea of their, their anemic status or the health of the animal. And then the same with taking a fin. You take a little fin clip, not the part of the fin with the bone, so not the rays, but the little soft tissue bit. You look at that under the scope as well, and that can also help you see if there's parasites there. 
And that's just a really nice diagnostic tool to have and it's something that's simple that you guys can easily do. So I've got here RTT or response to therapy and this is almost like a cautionary tale day that you're not going to go and run a whole bunch of diagnostics off on your animals when they come in. So someone brings an animal in, you look at it, it's got a wound on its side, you know that amoxicillin or clavulox can actually help fix that. You don't turn around and get a swab out of that animal, send it off for a culture, come back with what the bacteria is and then look up what its sensitivity and resistance are and turn around and feed and give them the antibiotics to that. You base it on the fact that I've seen this 5,000 times, I know that if I give it a five day course of clavulox at you know, 12 and a half milligrams per kilogram, twice a day it's going to work. That's great in theory, but that's a really, really dangerous thing to do in production systems. Okay, it's fine for an individual, it's not fine, but it's what happens with individuals, but it's really not fine when you're talking about production systems, because we've got VFDs, which Dr. Riker is going to talk to you about this afternoon, and we've got huge antibiotic resistance problems, particularly in Ohio, and in fact I'm working on a project at the moment where we've got a master's student working on it, looking at some of the resistance problems around the state, and the amount of antibiotic resistance in soils and that is quite scary. Okay, so I'm sort of going, I'm, I'm using this to point out that the chances are you probably are going to have a couple of bags of Romet sitting um, in the back of your shed somewhere and you're going to get fish which are going to look sick like they did two years ago and you're going to be really tempted to pull out that Romet and feed them and see if they get better and they might, that's a possibility. But as a veterinarian, and I assume Matt will agree, um, we do not advise that. You know, it is worth the cost of getting out the vet, or it's worth the cost of at least calling up Matt and talking to somebody and actually finding out what's going on and getting a better idea for your diagnostics than actually using this response to therapy. It might work when you take your dog into general practice, but it's really not a very good idea. You know, plus the fact it can also turn out to be plain and simply expensive that you, know, you go down to the local co-op and you buy medicated feed and you feed it and it doesn't work, you've just blown hundreds of dollars and then you've got to come back from it. Okay, so moving on to environmental things and this is probably something which is more aquarium based than aquaculture based but I want to sort of talk about it because the principles are still there. First thing is filtration systems. Problem is filtration Putting in filters is expensive, and so we always go for the minimum. And we do the exact same thing in the aquarium industry. We turn around and we know half a horsepower is going to power this tank, so therefore I'm going to put half a horse on there. What I then turn around and do is I end up adding more fish to there, or you know, we add different displays in there, or we change it around, or we haven't actually changed our filters out in a while, or that half a horse is now really you know, a third of a horse because that engine's five years old and it's not working as well. But we always go for minimums. The problem is, is that our organic loads always change and the ability of the filter to actually deal with it is probably going to diminish fairly quickly with time. So we're often dealing with the problem that what, we do, what we've got is not what we originally intended and what we set up for and therefore we're sort of always pushing our systems. And to sort of quickly give alligators as an example to this, the alligator filtration system for production there is dump and refill. We used to feed out twice a day to alligators and anyone who's actually ever owned any pet reptile, you feed them like twice a week. Because they're trying to grow these guys so quickly, they're feeding them twice a day. Consequently, it's costing a huge amount of money because they're not eating it. The pellets that we actually feed alligators was designed 25, 30 years ago and whilst they've served them really well, one of the big disadvantages to these pellets is they only sit on the top of the water for about two hours then they dissolve and they sink to the bottom. And so we're feeding an animal probably realistically four to five times more the amount than it actually needs to eat. And then all of that organic matter on top of all of the feces produced by this carnivore are all going down to the bottom of the tank. And so they used to try putting filters on them and they literally could not come up with a filtration system which could actually cope with the organic load going on. So the best way to deal with it is to actually dump the water down, so do basically 90% water changes. Leave just enough water in there so that the gators aren't left high and dry because that stresses them. Dump the water out, get rid of the organic load, fill it back up. Do that two or three times a week. So what we've done is, is that we've managed to convince the big companies that feeding twice a day isn't a good idea. I've been pushing for feeding every second day 
but they've compromised and they've gone to feeding once a day. But consequently, our water quality has just gone up enormously. The amount of water changes we do, which is expensive, because each time you fill up water with alligators, you actually have to heat it. So even down in Florida, they're still use, running big propane AM heating systems to warm up the water. So it's cut, cut down the cost on water changes, cut down the amount of water they're actually using. And touch wood, since we've started doing that, we've not had any major AM disease outbreaks. And I believe that's at least in part due to the fact that we've cut down this organic load a considerable amount. So filtration systems are important to always aim for more than what you think you need because invariably you will actually need them. All right, we can actually use our tank to help us work out what's going on. Water quality, which we've already covered. One of the tricks we used to do in the aquarium is on those filter systems, we used to actually stick screens on the filters. So if we thought there was a parasite outbreak and particularly considering we were dealing with multiple species within a tank and we were dealing with huge tanks, we could stick screens on them and then we could actually um, collect like eggs, for example, as they came through the screens. It was a nice way of concentrating everything in the water. It had to pass through the filter. Pull off the screens after a day or two. We have to also do that for E. coli counts and see what's going on. Okay. <clears throat> other thing you can do is, is that you don't just think about your target species. Think about the other species which are in the tanks, whether that's other species of fish, whether it's a... Um, snail gastropod species, so snail species that you've got in there, whether you've got plants going in there, whether you've even just got an algae overload. So the other species which are actually going on within your environment can influence your health. Okay, so laboratory wise, this is what we've done. At this stage we can collect this amount of information, then after that we need to refer to a diagnostic lab. Probably the most important thing to know is there is a really good fish diagnostic lab right here, in, well that building over there that you're going to go over and do your necropsy in. Um, there's a good team of pathologists and diagnosticians and technicians who actually know how to screen for a bunch of diseases and they'll help you work through it. So this resource is here for you. As very general rules, what you do is, is that you grab four of the tank mates. If you've got a problem in your tank, grab four of the sick guys. Do not send the dead ones in. The reason we do that is, is that before a fish actually dies, it starts to rot. Okay, fish and invertebrates are probably the two worst phylums of animals for actually starting to autolyze before they've even died. So if you wait and you pull out a fish that's dead, even if you think it's died literally in your hands as you're pulling it out, by the time you get it in here to the diagnostic lab, it's probably beyond being able to do a lot of the pathology on it. Okay, so send in sick animals which are either cured as soon as you're sending them or better yet if they can actually be sent in live but that's something to arrange with the actual diagnostic labs. Um, that's the best thing and that's the best chance of being able to get a diagnosis. Okay? They'll do a gross examination, they can do a um, sterile microbiology on liver, kidney, heart, brain, spleen. Probably the two most important organs for them are liver and kidneys. So if you are working with a vet who's then submitting samples, probably as a minimum if they're doing necropsies for you, get them to grab liver and kidneys and put that in formal and, and send it in for here. One of the tricks that we used to do, I used to work down at the Tropical Aquaculture Lab in Florida. One of the things we used to do, any fish that we'd actually receive, we'd do wet mounts, say um, squish preps on them. So before we sent anything off for histo or anything like that, we would actually go through, do the necropsy, take little small samples of each organ and we'd literally squish it onto a microscope slide and we'd have a look at under the microscope. And that was a great way of us being able to see if there were parasites there, see what sort of things they'd potentially been eating. We could then stain that up if we needed to to see if there was bacteria going on. And a, um, what's the other thing we used to do? Oh, and then if we were looking at organs like the liver and that, we could see if there were any sort of gross changes going on, so like hemosiderin, for an example, which tells us that there's some sort of systemic disease. Um, so, you know, that was a really good, quick way that we could actually get preliminary diagnoses back out to the producers and get them to start treating. Okay, blood collection isn't something we do so much in fish medicine, but it is what we do in the other aquatic species. And then a really cool tool that we've got now, which you can, cool, which we can talk to um, vets about, is doing PCR screenings. So a lot of common diseases now can be diagnosed through PCR, and whoever's doing the necropsy knows how to collect samples for that. But that's not an expensive tool anymore. Okay, so husbandry is not just water quality. All right, we've kind of covered a lot of this so we can breeze over it, but it's really things which maximize pathogens, so the things we're trying to avoid, 
is things like the amount of organics, and we've talked about with the alligators and the feeding and all that, within the tank, and so that's high stocking densities of fish, that's excess amounts of biofilms and sediments, so food sinking to the bottom, and that's dead animals and uneaten food that we're not pulling out. But it's also the organics without, and that's anything with a pocket of moisture. So a lot of the diseases that we're dealing with in aquatic animal health survive in water. And so even if you think about it that we've got either food which has moisture in it or you've got a, um, bits of water sitting on the floor between your tanks or you're taking a net and you're using the net in this tank then you're using it over in this tank or as you pull out your net it's splashing up on the, a, um, the walls. All of that is putting moisture around your facility and every single piece of moisture can actually hold the pathogens that you're trying to keep out in them. Okay? All of those things favour pathogen survival and transmission. So to minimise pathogens, what we try and do is, is that we think in terms of not just the fish in the tank, we think of the non-living things, so we're thinking of um, the water, the system components, the floors, walls which we've covered, and then the other fish which are actually in the tank. Or if you're dealing with things like ponds, the other animals which have access. You, know, you think about you take your dog down to your ponds with you, your dog loves to splash into the pond, it goes pond one, it goes to pond three, it goes to pond four. It's basically just transmitted diseases if there are any between one, three and four. Okay, same with cumorants. I know Bill Lynch absolutely hates the cumorants which fly near his hey, um, ponds. They're really great transmitters and vectors of disease. All right. Probably one of the biggest things for biosecurity and actually being able to control the transmission of diseases and pathogens is people management. And probably one of the biggest things I'm doing with the alligator farms at the moment, and I've actually just worked with them, I, um, I've worked with their farms that they own in Australia, in Africa, in Asia, and throughout the United States, is, is that we're putting together a quarantine plan, so queue management plans. And really the whole thing is biosecurity. And the premise behind it is, what can we do to minimise getting the disease into the tanks in the first place? So everything that we're actually doing is trying to control or minimise the risks of moving diseases in. Okay, and that comes down to doing risk assessments. And so each disease we can think of, we go, is this a big risk? Is this a small risk? What should we be doing about it? The risk management, how are we going to go about trying to control this? And then the most important bit is the risk communication. It doesn't matter if I really believe my farm should have a biosecurity plan. If I then let everybody just walk straight in after and not everybody that comes through my farm gate buys into my biosecurity plan, then I might as well not have one. Okay? Everybody that's on that farm should comply with your rules basically on how you're going to try and keep diseases and pathogens out. And so our goals are really animal population management, pathogen management and people management. Part of that is knowing what animals that you actually get. So when I worked with aquarium, we used to go out and we used to harvest animals from the wild because the aquariums were different to zoos. If we went out every year and just replaced the giraffes we killed in the zoos by catching a couple more giraffes and bringing them in, there'd be this huge public outcry. But within the aquarium industry, it's still acceptable to go down to the Florida Keys each year and just collect the fish that have died out and replace them. It's changing now as AZA becomes more important. We're starting to share between facilities. We're starting to breed our own fish. But back in the day, going back a decade or so ago, it was still acceptable to just go out, catch more fish and replace them. Problem with that is, is that they come in with unknown history and you can't really control them. And so it's exactly the same for you guys with production, that you've got to know your source, know where you're getting your animals from. And if you can get them from a good controlled environment, you've got less chance of spreading diseases. Part of this, which I'm not really going to go into, but uh, um, Dr. Reichley can talk about in good detail and so can Matt, is, is that the immune status or the health of your fish are actually going to be influenced by genetics, so what breeds you're collecting and whether you've got them bred against specific diseases, and then the husbandry that you do. So putting in place is things which are going to decrease their stress. So we used to have a 30-day clearance period where we bring in, always have all in, all out. A, um, keep our population isolated from everything else that was on the aquarium or on farm and then physically remove any animals or any other sort of um, things which could be a risk and then we check them when they came in, we check them throughout the period and then we check them before we clear them and actually release them onto the farm or into the aquarium. Okay, at that, that's my dad. He's 94 years old. He's still very grumpy. He has an 
IQ of 156, which means he likes arguing with you constantly. But more importantly, he actually served in World War II. He was in the Royal Navy, and he got knighted a couple of years ago for his role in the storming of Normandy. So I'm quite like Veterans Day. My brother served, I served, so it's sort of a thing in our family. So thank you to everyone who served. That's it. So stress management at every stop, um, let's go. It's the same presentation as last year. Uh, if you have questions, let me know. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, w which I should have kind of updated this and started more with the genetics because a lot of it does uh, make a big difference on those animals that have been um, kind of bred, whether it be here in Ohio or in New Mexico or Idaho or wherever it may be. Um, starting with good quality genetics is a great way to go. Uh, and starting with a good source, um, uh, period, whether they've been kind of genetically uh, changed to be more in tune to an RAS instead of a regular pond system or whatever it may be, uh, but it makes a good point. Uh, so, for, so for those of you who don't know, a huge chunk of the folks that are here today are part of Aquaculture Boot Camp, uh, which is, a, a, of course, a, a beginner group of folks who some have already started their system, some have it. But when you, start, when you first start getting out, you better take, um, you, you, regardless, you better be a lifelong learner, but you better start with the available information that's already out there. Uh, there's a bunch of extension publications that are written by uh, researchers or extension and university folks uh, that, are geared towards, um, that are geared towards farmers. And so there's stuff like the role of stress in fish disease, disease prevention on fish farms, biosecurity and aquaculture. So a lot of the same stuff we talked about today. A lot of people like presentations and can watch videos, don't, don't necessarily want to read an extension publication, but especially for those uh, folks who get on uh, to larger farms with multiple employees, everyone has to be on the same page about what everything means, whether it's the biosecurity protocols and you do this, this, and this, um, and you better follow them because if there's one weak link, um, um, the, the entire farm's at jeopardy and especially Dr. Reichley will talk later, but he works for Clear Springs Food, which is a 100% an employee-owned operation. Well, everyone has skin in the game, so you better be uh, doing what you can to make sure that the operation is sound, that the protocols are sound, and that everyone's taking things very seriously. Uh, so if you're just starting out, there's a bunch of res physical resources like us, but there's also uh, a lot of publications out there to take care of. But of course, eventually you have to stop just reading about it and actually go out and do it. So you've got to be stocking. Uh, you've got to uh, limit the stress on the animals at every stop, and that's why the title is what it is. But when you're stocking the animals, how do you do your best to reduce the stress there? Once they're actually in the ponds, how do you go through and maintain a good water quality? Because we can't harp on that enough, and uh, basically everyone will, uh, you'll hear um, uh, maintaining good water quality being kind of at, uh, at the forefront, kind of after genetics and, and proper system design and things like that. Uh, but you've got to maintain good water quality because animals are pretty hardy. Uh, and then when things don't go right, how do you take care of the systems? For example, we've got some harmful algal blooms and some bad algae here. It's going to pull down my oxygen. How do I best remedy the situations as quickly as possible uh, to limit the stress and then also limit uh, the loss of life? And just uh, severe stress will uh, greatly inhibit their ability to feed for the next several days. Um, whether this be directly related, it's hard to separate yesterday and today because I'm trying to think about what, um, uh, what Dr. Flint talked about with the alligators and the lights needing to be off all the time and just the, fear, uh, the, the sheer act of flipping on the lights causes stress to where they might not eat for a week. That's no different than some of the companies in, uh, uh, in Iowa who have to leave lights on at least just a little bit because whenever someone comes in at the middle of the night because an alarm goes off for whatever reason uh, or they just forgot some paperwork and you flip all the lights off and all the fish jump out of the tanks because that's just, uh, that's just a reaction for them. So you've got to limit the stress um, and, and kind of know, know your animals first and foremost. Uh, of course, you've got to go through and limit the stress when you're harvesting them. Uh, it is a problem when you're doing a food fish because we want to limit cortisol levels and we want to limit any stresses that can cause off flavor 
and an animal, but especially if it's a pond and lake management company, these animals need to arrive at their new location uh, not only alive, but they better be thriving by the time they get there. And there's a lot of stressors that, in, that are involved with corralling those animals up, physically loading them up, uh, which this is a larger operation, so they have a boom truck lifting the fish out of the water and dumping them uh, directly into the, uh, into the hauling tank. But then those fish might have to uh, uh, sit in a hauling truck for uh, a few hours and unfortunately a few days or a couple weeks, depending on <laughs> the way that operation is set up. And then from harvesting to actually grading out, uh, for example, this is a bunch of goldfish, but going out and, and grading these uh, fish in these vats to, uh, to be shipped, uh, and then, of course, actually hauling those animals. I've uh, talked about this present, uh, these next couple slides a lot, both here uh, in other states as well, because I'm not a veterinarian, but I kind of like um, the thoughts I can, uh, everyone's had a little bit of depression, a little bit of insomnia, uh, I have heartburn chronically, which luckily the doctors got me on medicine now. Uh, headaches, heartburns, all that sort of stuff is stuff we, um, uh, either ourselves or our family, deals with all of the times, and it particularly deals with, um, uh, it, it is brought on by stress. And then a couple of the things I point out with is there are differences between our acute stressors and our chronic stressors. Uh, so of course it's just being chased around, um, new challenges, athletic competitions, running sprints, yada, yada, yada. And then your chronic stresses, which is driving to work, um, poor sleep habits, your annoying boss, which might be the world's best boss, um, could be negative friends, a whole bunch of stuff that falls into effect. Um, but of course, oftentimes with stressors in our animals, it's often a combination. So the acute stress certainly may just be the harvesting or the crowding up of those animals. Uh, it might be, yes, you want to view your animals every day, but you, a lot of times you gotta be extremely sneaky because different species act different. Uh, some want to come right up to you because they know you're feeding. Others get terrified and they dart away. Well, that's a brief bit of kind of an acute stressor there. Um, but it also could be your chronic or stuff that's happened over a long period of time. I put, uh, for example, too strong a water flow. Oops, that should have already been up. Too strong a water flow, but it cer certainly can be poor systems design. And then what we always, I always like to revert back to, of course, is just water quality. You know, it could be just something as simple as, an ionized ammonia being something at a point that it's not, um, it's not an acute stressor that immediately causes that animal to, uh, to pass away. But if it's at a low level, um, it's stuff that's going to just slowly and slowly and slowly kind of wear on their immune system. And what's difficult is if you're not testing, you just assume that your tilapia have never fed better in their entire lives. But if you're actually testing and realize if you could change things up even just a slight little bit, they might eat an extra 10% a day. If they eat an extra 10% a day, depending on your markets, but if your market is to get that product um, to an actual market size as quickly as possible, uh, yeah, it, it, it can pay to do that because you can knock weeks or months off how long it actually takes. So they may be, it may be at such a chronic level to where it's, they're still feeding well, and it seems like they're doing well, uh, but just taking the time to do a little bit of water quality Maybe it's a little bit more water exchanges. Maybe it's adding on uh, a fairly inexpensive filtration, uh, extra filter uh, to help the capacity of your filtration system or something along those lines uh, can really go a long way. So start by doing your homework. Uh, I mentioned that, but it does certainly only go so far. With the slides I showed earlier, they're extension publications, uh, but like um, these presentations here are all being recorded to post online. Uh, but there's a bunch of other stuff that's already out there. Uh, for example, my buddy Dr. Nick Phelps uh, over there, there at the University of Minnesota uh, gives and what you need to know as an aquaculture producer. So he is an aquatic veterinarian uh, and actually heads up the, the uh, uh, co-director of the Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center. So he's kind of shifted gears a little bit uh, about three years ago or so. Uh, but he has, um, uh, after spending time in Arkansas, he's uh, pretty acutely aware of what's going on uh, with the industry, and so there's some fantastic resources out there. Uh, you hear a bunch, uh, as you always do, but uh, prevention's always better than, uh, than going through the cure. It's also going to be a lot cheaper, um, and it's usually uh, better to go, have, go ahead and have those good habits in place rather than panicking at the last minute, searching for a veterinarian that you don't have a clue with, trying to get me on the phone, uh, calling in people who, if it's a larger operation, may be on vacation, and they're the ones that kind of house the knowledge of what to do when stuff's going wrong. 
uh, having those good protocols ahead of time and following them is going to go a long way. And then, uh, yeah, just take your time. Uh, I, I guess I do talk about genetics, um, and of course some are going to uh, need better water quality um, than others. They're going to need less turbidity, and of course uh, you're going to do uh, less handling. It's very species dependent, but it's not uncommon at all to take uh, one species, stock it into a pond, and basically never touch it until it's time for harvest at the end of the, end of the year. Um, there are certainly other cases where animals are much hardier, especially if uh, the time of year uh, allows it where it pays to go through and handle those animals uh, slightly a little bit more in order to help grade those out because in the end that trade-off makes it worth it to go through and grade those animals, separate them into separate tanks um, uh, or ponds or whatever it may be. But you understand you handle those animals as least amount as possible. Uh, and then when you do it, you have enough people on hand to, to allow that to happen quickly. Um, it is not uncommon at all for someone to try to harvest a pond uh, or tanks or however the situation is set up with way too few of people what they actually need because they don't have anybody else on staff. Um, you better be calling your, your brothers or your sisters or, or your neighbors or somebody to help you out because if you crowd these animals up, whether it's a tank or a pond or whatever it may be, and you take entirely too long to go through and either grade these animals out, separate them, or maybe you're uh, actually going through and harvest them, the longer you take for that to actually occur, the more stress it's going to be put on that animal, which is going to uh, greatly inhibit its ability to recover. And that's, depending on your market, that's definitely what you want to do. Now, if you're just harvesting and throwing them on ice um, or throwing them in an ice slurry bath to, to slow them down, uh, that's, a, that's another thing. But you still need to do that as quickly as possible to help limit um, the, uh, the fillet quality and, and, and help keep that as high as quality as possible, as good a quality as possible. Uh, know your supplier if you're not growing them. Um, I mentioned kind of earlier, preferably that these animals haven't spent weeks uh, on a transport truck. Um, and really letting the supplier know extremely early. And it is always hard to tell, especially if you're dealing with a final lake management company, because you don't necessarily know what's going to be needed until you get a little bit closer. Um, but there are some publications out there that are talking, which huh, I was one of the authors on, but uh, talking to our guys when we were in Arkansas, um, very large operations that sell a ton in the, into the state, and they always uh, habitually tell us, let us know as soon as possible so that we can prepare. If not, we'll be able to prepare and, and have those animals for you, but we want to prepare ahead of time so that we know that um, uh, everything on our end is set up perfectly for you to receive the best quality animals because I know that I know that I know that you're going to be purchasing these and we've set up these arrangements ahead of time. Um, but there are uh, some operations where uh, fish sit on a truck for entirely too long and there's only so many water exchanges, so many times you can add in uh, ice to drop the temperature down, only so many times you can go through and add uh, you know, chloramine eaters or ammonia eaters and things like that. So, um, uh, know where your know where your suppliers getting their uh, fish from, and how long they've been uh, on the roads. Uh, certainly a great thing. Take the time to properly acclimate those fish. Uh, down on the bottom right is the same picture of stocking that we showed earlier, but just catfish fingerlings uh, hybrids actually going in. Uh, but understand the water quality of the current water as well as the destination uh, or your quarantine water. Uh, these fish were grown on the farm, uh, and it's all the same. Uh, water in this particular area. So from the hauling truck to the pond that they were going into, even though it's from the same exact farm, we're still going to check things like our pH and our, and our temperature uh, and our dissolved oxygen to make sure that from the get-go, because that's where a lot of people uh, end up losing their animals, is from the very beginning. Uh, in particular, it's really difficult in Ohio if you're dealing with a crustacean. You're dealing with a freshwater shrimp and you stock these uh, PLs in there, uh, or advanced PLs, and then they're at the bottom. It's, there's no knowing what's going on unless you have some sort of sampling device to know what's going on. So uh, the beginning seems kind of nice and it seems kind of like if it's been a long time coming and you finally got to that point, uh, you just want the animals in there so that you can get uh, started and hopefully eventually make some money uh, and crank out a product come September 15th. Um, that's all great and wonderful, but if you don't start off right, uh, just kind of wasting your time and wasting your energy. Uh, and it's not uncommon at all for people to feed their shrimp uh, the entire time. 
uh, and then come September they drain the pond down and find about a whopping 10% survival. Uh, at that point, there's literally no idea of when this mortality occurred, but most likely it probably occurred at the very, very beginning, especially when they're extremely small. If they do happen to die because pH of the water that they're going into was entirely too high, uh, if they're extremely small, it's really hard to see because they're probably going to sink to the bottom, but even if they float to the side, uh, really small ones get picked off very quickly by birds, um, uh, and then you can just flat out not see them. Uh, but that's the same whether it be uh, uh, small tilapia or small uh, any sort of fin fish going into your system. Uh, so just take the time. So if you're going to float, uh, float in bags, if that's the way you've gotten your fish in from, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but float them in that water for a period of time. Uh, open it up uh, and exchange some water. Uh, and we can talk later about how quickly or slowly we want you to exchange that water. And certainly those animals are most likely going to be salted. Um, there are a bunch of quarantine tanks uh, and stuff that we talk about. So Q13 over here on this uh, uh, aquarium over here, just it's these animals have just been brought in uh, to this operation. It doesn't matter if these cichlids uh, have been uh, transported from uh, down the street um, uh, from another operation, or if they've been shipped from, uh, or if they've been harvested from the wild, or if they've been shipped from another farm uh, on, in the other country. Uh, these animals have, are going to have a mandated period of time that they have to sit in there because that crowding up, that transporting, that unloading, that change in water quality uh, from the time, uh, from the beginning until that point, there's a lot of stressors involved there. So it only makes sense to kind of segregate those guys. Uh, and by segregate, I mean don't put them in this fish tank, but yet the filters are all still tied to everything else. That's completely pointless. But if they're going to stress out, and break out with something, uh, we need them to do it on their own tank. So if we lose them, uh, we're not jeopardizing the rest of the system. And then a lot of times there's a difference between bringing fish on and kind of holding them for a, a period of time. Uh, there's a difference between just holding them and seeing if they're going to break out. Uh, but in particular, if you have a specific species that you know, uh, a very scary virus only happens at uh, degree temperature 75 or above, but that water quality is only sitting at 68, and that's what the water that they were being hauled in uh, is, or, or cooler. That's fine. Put them in there, but then crank them up to that temperature um, uh, that they're most likely, if they do happen to have a disease and they're going to break out, uh, make sure that you crank it up to that, uh, to that temperature just because you want to protect yourself before they ever get into that system. Um, I'm not the vet. The other folks can tell you more about that stuff, but that's there. Uh, once they're stocked, we've got to do proper feeding, uh, of course, water remediation being key, so it's always water quality, water quality on my end. Um, uh, feed as much as they'll eat, uh, but it really limits, uh, and I say limit risk, and it really depends on your market. Uh, coming from Arkansas, we might have uh, ponds that were extremely highly uh, densely populated with golden shiners, or say they're at goldfish, they're at greater than two million an acre. I mean, there's a ton of fish in this pond, but I might be feeding just enough for maintenance ration because I know my markets aren't until July 4th when everyone's fishing or, golden, or it's golden shiners and July 4th is when everyone's fishing. I might restrict feed, but if you're doing a typical food fish operation where it's your goal to get those animals out of your system as quickly as possible uh, and get that risk off your farm, because the longer they sit there, uh, the more risk your farm is incurring the risk of someone hitting a transformer, the risk of a bad snow, uh, the risk of heavy bird predation that year. Um, you don't really know what the future is going to hold, so feeding those animals as heavily as possible, but by being a good steward of your water and getting them off uh, is going to lower your risk and hopefully uh, improve cash flow too if you're really focusing on something like saltwater shrimp and you need to get them in and out of your operation as quickly as possible. Um, I talk about multiple feeds per day uh, are going to limit our filtration burden, and we deal with that uh, a lot in our research systems. And it all gets back to water quality, of course, because it's what I like to talk about. But the, and particularly with the filtration burden, it is not uncommon at all to limit those feedings, and it does cost more in manpower uh, uh, to be able to go through and feed maybe three or four times a day. But it certainly beats feeding twice a day in those filtration systems or once a day and those, because it's going to be the same ration, whether it's broken up in four times over the day or once a day, but you can really limit the burden on the capacity of what your filtration systems have 
by breaking it out, the systems can be a lot more efficient uh, and it limits the likelihood of the filtration system being overburdened so much that uh, it collapses or it just completely clogs up with, with organic load because we know the 100% feed ration that we feed, almost 50% of that's coming out as waste. How are we going to go through and do that? It's a lot easier on these filtration systems, whether it's a, uh, honestly, whether it's a pond system, a RAS system, aquaponics, whatever it may be, you still have filtration systems, whether it's just um, uh, the normal organic matter uh, or nitrifiers or, and denitrifiers that are in your uh, pond system or physically located in uh, particular filters, whether a RAS or an aquaponics. Um, boo -boo. I don't know why that's in there. All right, I think I'm running behind, so I'm going to uh, try to go a little bit faster, but uh, some of the stuff I am going to focus on because I do see it being such a big part, things like temperatures, we got to understand that um, uh, the water temperature is going to be determined by the environment because, the, because these animals are poikilotherms. We don't have the luxury, they don't have the luxury of self-regulating like we do. So we have to understand that our tilapia, yellow perch, and salmon are all going to sit on a wide variety of scales so we have to understand that from a stress factor that um, it does take them quite a bit of time to actually go through and regulate um, and shifting those guys from usually from too cold to too hot uh, can really be detrimental. It's not quite as big a deal to go from more of a warm water to a cooler water, um, but taking care of them. We'll do this quickly, but there are some lethal uh, uh, temperatures, of course, with all of our species and optimals. But if it's too hot, they're going to spend all their energy, just the cost to survive. So you get into more of a bioenergetics model. So they eat the ration. They spend a certain percentage of that, or a certain percentage of that is excreted as waste. A certain percent of that becomes metabolizable. A certain percentage of that's going to go to, uh, if it's not uh, a sterile, it's going to go towards, you know, uh, gamete or, or egg or, or sperm production. But there's a certain amount of that that is going to go to the fillet quality. And so if it's just entirely too hot for a tilapia even to survive, they might eat. Uh, but most of that's just going to be going because if anyone's seen uh, fish that are in uh, either a low oxygen situation but in a really hot situation, you see that their uh, opercle opens and closes extremely fast. They're trying to push as much water over their oxygen, uh, enough water over their gills as quickly as possible to extract whatever oxygen's in that situation. So it's a very uh, energy intensive if a situation is just too warm for them to go through. And then, of course, just the opposite. If it's too cold, uh, they're just not going to eat. So their metabolism and their cost to survive is fairly low, but they're not eating, high, they're not eating enough food to actually go on and pack on any weight. Uh, and good quality fillet yields is, uh, of course, what we're striving for. But you've got to keep it within range and hopefully more at an optimal growth. And that, that sits the same, whether it be temperature, ammonia, whatever it may be. Uh, doo -doo. And of course we discussed, and, and this is uh, fairly simple stuff since we've already gone over the water quality situation for ABC, uh, but of course your temperature rise, just the overall saturation of that oxygen uh, drops substantially. Uh, While well, the saturation stays the same, but the, uh, uh, the amount that that water is actually going to hold decreases a lot. So if you take that same tilapia at 77 and throw them at 95 or 100 degrees, they're going to have to open and close just because it's extremely hot, but also because there's just overall less oxygen available in that water, and they need to, uh, they need to use up uh, and, and work twice as hard to be able to gain uh, enough oxygen for their systems to, uh, to continue to go strong. And same thing for a pond system. There's a reason we use things like aeration, uh, and there's a reason that we're doing uh, the on-farm extension demonstration projects at uh, a couple of the perch farms here is to see how in particular, adding a whole bunch of extra oxygen to our situations uh, can hopefully improve growth. And uh, we've seen some good results so far. And we'll harvest on Monday and Thursday if anyone wants to come out and help. Um, I'm running out of time, so I don't want to focus too hard on pH. It's fairly common stuff. Uh, I'll go kind of quickly through our ammonia. Uh, uh, and once again, this is, this is more of the timeline where the animals are in that actual situation. And you've got to limit the stress as much as possible in order to go through uh, and reach a successful harvest. But it's no, um, uh, it's no, um, it's no s secret that this ammonia in our situation, this is nitrogen particularly in a fish pond, but runs the same way with 
uh, or aquaponic systems, it just happens to be, uh, or in a, in a RAS, it just happens to be, uh, these are actual filtrations and not usually just bacteria suspended in the water on organic loads. But our goal, of course, is just to get that tan all the way down to nitrate as quickly as possible because some of that other stuff is extremely toxic. Um, and even in an RAS system, uh, we know of uh, several cases where nitrates do get high enough. Everyone likes to say that it's uh, not going to harm your animals, but we have uh, definitely seen where nitrate gets high enough uh, in a system, especially one that's uh, not really discharging a whole lot of water um, at all, where nitrates really build up and cause a stressor on those animals, uh, and they either stop growing or they end up losing some fish due to nitrate. Uh, once again, that's more of a understanding how your species and your systems are set up and doing your best to limit, um, uh, limit any chronic or acute stressors, in particular with whether it be um, uh, an ionized, uh, of course, these are NH3 or nitrite or a nitrate. You know, most of the time, those are going to be more of your chronic stressors and stuff that happens and affects them over time. Uh, treat these guys at the correct time. Uh, we got to be careful. Um, predation by birds is definitely less of a, honestly, for the most part, it's less of a problem here than when we were in Arkansas because we were in the heart of the Mississippi Flyway and it wasn't uncommon at all to have uh, extreme predation uh, through a substantial part of the year. Uh, but it still is a very real concern here and understanding how stressful it is on animals just to being able to, uh, to uh, escape birds and um, it's one thing Bill likes to talk about, especially when he has cormorants on his operation. It's not uncommon for that pond, if he sees a cormorant on that pond, for that pond to basically go off feed for a couple days. Uh, it's very stressful on an animal, and I just literally took this off of one of my books, and it's actually that's as a barracuda attack. So these animals, uh, it's very stressful to either do what they call kind of a flashbang ex uh, uh, and excitement motion, but even though it might be a quick get away from a bird, uh, it still takes a lot of toll on the animal which has huge economic benefits, uh, negative benefits. Uh, if it's the alligator and it's a week that that animal's not eating and they're, nor they're used to being fed once a week uh, or once a day, that's a huge loss in growth, especially if that happens uh, two or three times a year. Even if it only happens two or three times a year that someone flips on the lights, that's several weeks of growth loss. Um, uh, and this all boils down to this being a, a business and a venture that we're trying to go through. I won't spend too much time because I mentioned there's a lot of stuff going on there. If you do sample, do it as little as possible uh, to try to get an idea of, of what your market is um, and, and what your folks are looking for. Uh, we hear all the time that no one samples at all and they say, yes, I've got this many pounds come out to my operation and the person who's buying comes out to the operation in the pond and there's absolutely probably a fifth of what they actually thought was out there. Uh, and that's because no one's going to take time to go through and sample, uh, even though they really should, to get a general idea of uh, possible survival rate and what's going on in their ponds. Um, uh, you just see it a lot of times, but you got to go through and sample these animals at the right time. Uh, we're not going to go through and sample yellow perch in the middle of the summer because it's entirely too hot and we're going to lose a ton of fish. So we have to also be strategic, but we also know we're not really selling during that time anyways because uh, most of the companies understand that they're going to be selling to understand that it's entirely too hot to be moving these animals, but we'll come in the fall or we'll come in the spring. Uh, so you got to uh, take care and know what's going on. For example, the fish next week, they're not being sold until the spring, uh, but we want to understand our risk and know what could be lost over, the win over this winter. So all next week, we're going to be harvesting these fish out, getting a general idea of lengths and weights, uh, relative condition, feed conversion ratio, and those types of things so far so that come the spring, we'll not only have a good idea for those who we're selling to, uh, have a good idea of what's going on uh, and how many fish we have and those types of things, uh, but also understand our risk and what possibly what will be lost uh, to, to a winter kill. And a winter kill doesn't have to be 100% because uh, it certainly can just be ticked off a couple percent here, a couple percent there, and next thing you know, you're 10% down. Uh, but you've got to limit while promoting, so you've got to limit a whole bunch of stuff while promoting uh, good growth, uh, helping improve the fish's immune system by taking care of the animals, uh, and certainly uh, a good slime coat helps with the barriers to infection, um, and then understand our proper feeding practices, uh, and like I said, just limit surprises as much as possible. Take the feed off, move them indoors, and purge them uh, if you can, uh, especially if these animals are going to be shipped 
Uh, no one wants to purge an animal or no one wants to ship an animal that has a stomach full because the first thing that's going to happen is three hours from now that water quality is going to be absolute crap because it is uh, uh, that fish has just excreted a lot of waste through stress and just natural uh, natural movement so that crystal clear water uh, especially even if it's spring water if that animal is not purged that water quality drops uh, substantially within a very short period of time and of course the fish is going to take uh, taste a lot better if you've gone through and purged them properly before too uh, have a necessary ready. Um, this gets to more what I mentioned earlier. Don't be having two people doing a job that really takes four people to do. It's transferring fish are extremely, uh, extremely stressful. I don't know about you, but I don't want 15 of you laying on top of me uh, while we're all stuck in a small orange basket. Uh, but have enough people in hand to be able to go through and do that fairly quickly. Jones Fish does did a presentation in 2017, particularly on their protocols and what happens. Uh, in order, not uh, he mentioned for regulations, but um, uh, Chris gave the presentation in particular with um, uh, their biosecurity protocols. And uh, for those of you who are part of ABC, we were at their place the other day. Uh, what did they say? The biosecurity protocols is that they have uh, a gallon or a gallon and a half of Vercon, and when that f truck leaves that operation, you're to use that entire thing of Vercon before you're ever allowed back on that farm. Uh, and if it's full of mud, you better spray the mud off before you put the Vercon on because, of course, Vercon is not going to be eaten through the mud. Uh, and of course, that's not an endorsement for Vercon. That's just who they use. But uh, understanding every step from the, the stocking to maintaining the good water quality to harvesting them to transporting them and, and limit the, limiting the stresses there. Uh, purge them. If you're going to do uh, for a long time, of course, uh, we prefer oxygen, pure oxygen, and not just um, uh, pulling uh, atmospheric or pulling uh, just regular air out, uh, do a bunch of stuff, correct time for transporting, limit the stress and prevention. Final thoughts, we're all here to help. Uh, let us know uh, whether you've been in the business for a few days or for a long time. There's a lot going on at this day, and there's a bunch of resources already out there uh, by a, uh, a whole bunch of cool people. I mentioned um, uh, Dr. Phelps earlier. Um, Dr. Roy is down in Florida, uh, and Dr. Trushinsky has actually changed jobs since then. But she has an awesome presentation on, on various things that are involving with animal welfare. There's a bunch of presentations involving the animal welfare, limiting fish, uh, fish stress, um, because it is uh, something that if we kind of have everyone on board, uh, I mentioned kind of the one, if you have 20 people that work in your operation or two people in your operation, if someone's not kind of following the same protocols we need, uh, and it's not that hard, it's stuff you're doing every day because the last thing you want to do they stress the animals out to a point to where they end up dying. Uh, but it's actually physically getting stuff written down on paper and everyone kind of being trained the same way. Uh, and there's a lot of good presentations out there to help you guys out. Thanks a lot. I went through, uh, finished two minutes late. But if you have any questions, I appreciate it. Um, thank you. The first talk this afternoon, I want to talk a little bit about antibiotics and, and VFDs and, and aquaculture veterinary feed directives. Uh, just to give you an idea of, uh, you know, maybe some of you guys who aren't familiar or have heard about it, uh, but, but aren't, aren't really quite sure what it is. So, antibiotics in aquaculture, uh, most of the antibiotics or all the antibiotics that we use in, in food fish, and again, this talk is, is, is going to focus on food fish and not so much the ornamentals or, or pet fish side of things. Uh, our antibiotics are in the feed, right, which is a, a, a good way to deliver antibiotics, but it is, is challenging because the first sign of disease in fish, like any other animal, is, is what? They don't eat, right? So how, how is it? Now we're going to try and deliver antibiotic and, and feed, which is, which is very difficult. And, and I recognize that's a significant challenge uh, for many of you guys in the room, um, just based on your availability of, of feed, right, and, and geographic location and where the closest feed mill is. Uh, it's much more challenging for you to get medicated feed then, you know, when I sign a, a VFD at, at Clear Springs uh, the next day, the medicated feed gets delivered to the farm. So the speed with which we can deliver that is, is very different than what uh, you guys have here in, in, in the Midwest. But there are ways that you can work around that, working with your veterinarian, uh, <clears throat> um, in order to be able to have more, uh, let's say, rapid response or, or rapid uh, delivery of medicated feed. Look at that. We've got a question already. I love it. Yes, sir.
dietary concept of uh, whole food and stuff like that? Yeah, so it's a good question for those of you who didn't hear. He's asking about, you know, maybe for the size of our company, medicated feed may be beneficial, but for a small-time producer uh, or small producer that, that isn't uh, having as much uh, uh, food in the marketplace, is it more of a hindrance in, in comments about medi the medication antibiotics getting into uh, for humans to consume, and isn't that kind of against where, where we're at um, from that standpoint? What I would say, and, and you'll see when we go through some of these antibiotics, all the antibiotics have a withdrawal time, right? Which means that there's a, a scientifically derived uh, time with which after you feed that antibiotic to make sure that the residue is outside, uh, there's no more residue that, that, that persists in the filet. So, so none of this is a, is a, is a human health concern. Uh, you, you brought up whole foods and, and kind of is the antibiotics against whole foods and actually, so we, in that video it showed we have uh, our certification through GAA, BAP, and also BRC. Whole Foods has their own set of, of criteria to be able to raise fish. When I said Whole Foods, I wasn't talking about the brand. Oh. I was talking about the food as, as what we're growing. Sure. It's a primary, primary uh, uh, diet. But yeah. It's, uh, I'm not talking about Whole Foods. Okay. Uh, food as a whole, yeah, sure, and 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 so and you're right, and and so as we walk through this, and I recognize again, antibiotics are not the answer in in a lot of cases, and and we have customers who are asking us for never fed antibiotics. That this is this is something that that questions that we get from from our customers, and um, you know we're the exclusive provider of trout to Cisco Foods in the United States, uh, Costco Foods, uh, Costco stores, so so. We, we have a lot of customers, and we do both food service and retail, and some customers want never-fed antibiotics, and, and some are asking for antibiotic-free, which is more of a marketing thing because all, all food sold in the United States is antibiotic-free because of withdrawal times. So you definitely have to weigh what your market is and, and you know, see what the acceptance is for using medicated feed, but also, I mean, just like anything else that you do, it's cost-benefit analysis to see does it make sense for you to pay for medicated feed, uh, and, and does that medicated feed then save the you know whatever that, that fish is? So it's certainly not the answer, and it's not a silver bullet. Uh, most diseases in fish come back to husbandry. Uh, most of the pathogens we deal with are ubiquitous; they're always in the environment, and and the clinical manifestation of the disease usually is because of stress, whether it's an acute or chronic stress. So certainly medicated feed is not a silver bullet, and uh, even for a producer like us, our size, it's not the only answer. And, uh, and we're actually, we do things to, to minimize the amount of antibiotics that, that we have to feed. Um, but it's certainly a good tool to have if you do have uh, an outbreak um, of disease. So <clears throat> uh, I just want to run through to get started here some of the antibiotics that, that we have, and, and really it... Mm, <laughs> makes my life really easy as a veterinarian because there are three. I have fluorophenicol, oxytetracycline, and a potentiated sulfa. So this is very different than if you go into your small animal clinic or, uh, or beef or dairy practice. Uh, those veterinarians had to pay attention in pharmacology. I didn't because I only have these three to, to deal with. So it's very limited in what we can, and this goes back to making sure that, and that's, that's, that's for medicated feed or also any kind of external treatment, we're very limited in the United States of, of what we can use. And so it's making sure that we're using those tools in the most effective manner as, as, as possible. So fluorophenicol, um, it's sold as Aquaflor. That's the brand name. That's uh, Merck Animal Health that, that provides that. And you know, you're going to see these terms, and, and I put here bacteriostatic. And basically, the antibiotics can be put into two different categories, whether they're bacteriostatic or bactericidal. And what that means is cytal is killing, so it kills the bacteria, and static means it just keeps the, the bacteria as is. So basically the bacteria can't divide. So it actually, this antibiotic isn't killing the bacteria, it's just preventing it from replicating, uh, which then helps in, in, a, in the clinical manifestation um, of, the, uh, of the disease. Again, this is something that, that, that is incorporated into the, the pellet. Um, it can also be top-coated onto the pellet uh, at, at, the, uh, at the feed mill level. You see some dosing recommendations. Again, I'm, I'm not uh, too worried about it from that standpoint for you guys, but it's important to know when you look at the dosing that you're going to be feeding this feed. Once you start feeding it, you have to feed it for 10 consecutive days. Uh, and then you take that and add in the withdrawal time so you know that when you start feeding medicated feed, you're not going to be able to harvest those fish or to send them to the marketplace for at least 25 days with fluorophenicol. 
So again, that helps and that, that goes into that informed decision. Does it make sense to get the medicated feed? How long is it going to take me to get it? You know, and how big these fish are and you know, what that, that specific situation is and when those fish are, are going to go to market. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so. Right, yeah, so, so the question about, yeah, the withdrawal time in, 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 the, in the fillet, but also um, in the water column. So, so basically, what the withdrawal time, how that's calculated, this is going to get a little technical, so bear with me for a minute here, but they, they calculate, everything's based off of what they call a half life. Okay, so you have a drug and how long it takes for half of that to be decomposed. Uh, in the case of medicated feed, when that's getting into the fish, you have decomposition, but you also have metabolism of the drug, right? And so in the environment, too, that takes into account uh, what that half-life is. Uh, what, what I would say is that these withdrawal times that you see uh, at the bottom of the, the slide here and all the slides for the, for the different antimicrobials, um, that's dictated by the Food and Drug Administration. So that's FDA. And while they look at and do environmental assessments, uh, this is primarily geared toward human health uh, and human safety um, from the edible product. Uh, but what they do is in order for us to use it, uh, they have performed environmental assessments. And you can actually, all of this is, is publicly available online, and you can look at what, what that is. And they look at uh, the half-life of, of the drug in different environments, and they also look at different doses. So, you know, if you were to give 200% of the dose, uh, what the label claim is, how long does that persist in the environment, and, and more importantly, where it persists in the environment, whether that's in the water, does it, does it accumulate in the soils. Um, they look at uh, uh, different you know, crustacean uh, that may be in, in the area or other animals as well and, and what that accumulation looks like. It's actually a, a pretty thorough uh, assessment of, of the environment with which uh, uh, these drugs may persist or may not, and that, that all goes into play with the withdrawal time. But, but, but the primary focus from that is a human health standpoint. So it's important to recognize too. Oh, yes, sir. Related to that question there. So in the fish, in the thing we've seen about your uh, facility there uh -huh. in Iowa, so you've got, you got water flowing through different, several different containments. Right. So if you're feeding the containment at the top, if you're mm -hmm. putting antibiotics in the top containment, mm -hmm. does the water that goes from that containment to the next and the next and the next, is, are those fish all influenced by that antibiotic? Right, so again, so for the sake of the recording, just to repeat the question, the, his question is the cereal reuse environment where we raise our fish and you feed it in one, like the first use raceway, does that impact the second use or, or third use in the series? And uh, yeah, so uh, part of it is, is, and that's where when we, when we deliver medicated feed, I actually cut the, the, the feed rate significantly. And that's to make sure because the fish are, are not going to be eating, as we all know. We talked about that before, right? So uh, the amount of feed that we're putting into the raceway is, is significantly less than what it would be those fish normally would be eating. And the way that the cereal reuse system is set up is that we have what's called a quiescent zone at the end of each of our raceways. And that's where it allows for any of the settable solids to settle out. And then that, those settable solids will get, um, in, our, in our case, they get siphoned off to an offline settling pond and get removed from the environment. So, and, and when you feed, whether you have a cereal reuse system, when you treat a raceway, uh, the withdrawal time applies just to the raceway that you're treating. It doesn't apply to the cereal reuse downstream of that. And part of that is, is because, uh, again, the, the amount of feed, the, the, the uneaten feed and wasted feed will not go from one use to the next use because of those quiescent zones. Okay. They're specifically designed for that, well, it's for settable solids in general, but that, that takes that into account. It's not like in the liquid waste, like the urine and stuff? No, and so again, that, that, go, that goes back to how the drugs are metabolized in the fish okay. and the specific, the specific drugs that we have. Um, but that's not, that's been in, in, we're getting into an area where I'm not intimately familiar with the environmental assessment for fluorophenicol. Um, but they ta I can tell you that they take all that into account, but I, I wouldn't be able to give you specifics because I, I don't know those details off the top of my head. All right, very good. Okay. Uh, so it's important to point out, too, is all these medicated feeds, they're labeled for specific diseases, okay? So it's not like you can say, hey, I've got some sick fish. I want to go get some, some of this fluorophenicol or aquafluor and feed it to my fish and, and, and solve all the problems, right? We, we've talked about this isn't a silver bullet, but we, you need to have 
a, a um, diagnosed disease. And so like for aquaphor, you can see on the screen here, uh, it depends upon the fish species, it's labeled for specific um, uh, diseases. So those diseases have to be diagnosed in order for the veterinarian to prescribe, uh, or write the veterinary feed directive to, for you guys to be able to use it. So the second antibiotic that we have available is oxytetracycline. Uh, it's sold as teramycin. This is provided by Western Chemical. Again, you'll see that it's bacteriostatic. So it's not killing the bacteria per se, but it's preventing them from spreading. And so it decreases their, their, uh, their ability to infect the fish and, and, and um, drops from, from clinical disease. Again, there's dosing on there. Don't worry too much about the, 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 the amount, but, but again, it's recognized it's 10 days when you start that feeding. You feed for 10 days, and then, and then um, that's actually incorrect. I apologize. That's a 21-day withdrawal time uh, on teramycin. And again, so you can look and see what, what those diseases uh, are for, for teramycin or oxytet, depending upon the different fish species that, 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 uh, that you may be raising. Um, and again, these are things that have to be diagnosed in order for, for you to feed it. The third and final antibiotic that we have is Romet. Uh, it's a potentiated sulfa drug. Uh, this is the one bacterial cytal, so it actually will go in and, and kill the bacteria. Um, this can be incorporated into the feed, but also available as top coat. And it's interesting to point out for, especially you as producers, uh, you can actually top coat this at your farm. So those other ones are, are provided at the feed mill, but uh, for Romet, you can actually get the premix um, sent to your facility and you can top coat that. It becomes a little bit of a logistical challenge, uh, to be honest, when you're using this type of, of antibiotic because you have to top coat the feed and you have to add in some gelatin for it to, to stick to the feed pellets. You have to let the feed pellets dry uh, before you can, you can feed it. So uh, there's a little bit of work on here, but you'll notice that you have, uh, it's only for, for five days and then you can see the, the withdrawal time uh, for that. And for some of you who may be raising salmonids, recognize that that's a, a significantly longer withdrawal time uh, for Romat. And again, you can see very limited uh, bacterial targets that, that Romet is available for. So it's, it's, uh, we don't have very many antibiotics that we can use legally in the United States for fish, uh, and it's very um, uh, limited in, in the diseases that have to be diagnosed. But what I wanted to point out too and make you guys aware, if you don't already know, about uh, ADAP, which is the Aquatic Animal Drug Approval Partnership. So because we have such limited availability of, of antimicrobials in the US, and part of that is because drug sponsors, in order to get things approved, uh, the market is so small in the US, it doesn't necessarily make economic sense for them to invest a lot of money to get new drugs to the marketplace. When, when the market that's out there is, is, is relatively small. So um, this, this ADAP is, is a, a, a branch of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I have some, some uh, uh, URLs there. And, and two, if you guys have an interest, we can, we can get you PDFs of this presentation so you don't have to uh, write all this stuff down. But um, the, the reason I bring up ADAP is they have what's called an INAD program, Investigative New Animal Drug. And so what this does is uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service administers this, and basically what it is is it's an agreement with, with federal, state, tribal agencies, but also um, uh, institutions and, and private farms where uh, you can use additional therapeutics uh, that don't have label claims for what you're working with. So basically it allows you to do, use things uh, that aren't specific, specifically labeled for that. So it provides access to those therapeutics uh, in a way that allows uh, to kind of use it when it doesn't having gone through the entire approval process. And the point is, is that this does that. The trade-off is, is you have to collect data when you're using whatever that, that chemical may be or drug under the INAD program. And then that all gets feed, fed back into the system for them to collect data to demonstrate safety and efficacy in order for the sponsor to to get that, uh, get that approved. So it's basically the sponsor on their side of things, they spend a whole bunch of money to get something approved, but there's not many people that are gonna buy it in the US, so it doesn't make financial sense. So basically it's saying, okay, we as producers, uh, or state or federal or tribal agencies, whatever, we're going to use your, your drug uh, in a non-labeled manner so we can partner with you to help you generate the data that you need to get approved. So it's kind of a win-win for both sides. It, it helps expedite the approval of new drugs, 
um, but it reduces the cost for the, the, uh, the sponsor in order to get that drug approved. So this is a, a really good um, reference guide that I go to quite a bit. This has both medicated feed and also external treatments. So this desk guide, and, and if you go on to, um, to Google and you Google ADAP and uh, Fish and Wildlife Service or ADAP, comma, FWS, that's usually what I do to get to the website, but uh, you, can, you can get there and they have these freely available. So you can go on and request it and they will, they will mail you uh, a desk guide. They also have full-size posters that they'll send you. And like I said, this covers all of the approved drugs, uh, the concentrations, the 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 delivery time for external treatments, those kind of things. So this is a really, really handy um, reference guide that you may want to pick up um, to help you with both medicated feed and, and also external treatments. The American Fisheries Society also has a, a really good guide to using drugs, biologic, and other chemicals. So it kind of helps you navigate and, and figure out what you can use in a, in a legal manner, but also maybe gives you some ideas of, hey, you know, we have a problem that we've maybe this goes back to, you know, maybe if you were doing your wet mounts or gill clips that we did in the, in the necropsy, um, you're doing that on the farm level, you know, you can say, hey, look, we've got, we've got these parasites. This might be a, a way to take care of those parasites. So um, this, this really provides a lot of guidance on, on how to use some of those things. So veterinary feed directives, just generically, uh, what is a veterinary feed directive? Basically, it's a prescription. Okay, and so you go to the doctor, you're sick, they write you a prescription, you can get an antibiotic and, and, and you can use that. This veterinary feed directive, again, it's, it's, it authorizes you to have uh, a VFD drug in the feed. Um, and it must be used in accordance with the label and in provisions listed in the VFD, which we'll get to in a minute here. So VFD drugs, and th this is a big thing in, in, in the veterinary profession as a whole because a lot, there's a new rule that came out last year with VFDs. In aquaculture, it's, it wasn't too much of a surprise for us because Aquaphor, when it hit the market, has been a VFD the entire time. You used to be able to buy TM over the counter, and you can go to the store and get Oxytet and, and go feed that to your fish. Um, but now all of these drugs are, are considered VFD drugs, and they, you need a, a, a written VFD in order to, uh, to use them. So some people ask, well, how do I... How do I get a VFD or what's the process here? And so I kind of just wanted to outline a little bit about me as a veterinarian, what my responsibilities are legally in order to prescribe that VFD and to be able to make the VFD legal. And then we'll get to what the, what the producer and what the feed mill has to do. So first of all, we have to be licensed. Realize that veterinarians, uh, we don't have a national license. We actually have to get licensed in each individual state. So um, all the states I'm licensed in, I have to pay a nice annual fee to maintain my license. Uh, and I have to establish what's called a veterinary, patient, a veterinary client patient relationship, right? So this is, this is the same rules like if you go to your vet and they want, you, want, you want to get heartworm medication or something, they say, we haven't seen your, your dog in a year, we can't, we can't give you that, we have to examine the animal. Um, we have to establish that relationship. And that relationship is actually defined, and it, again, it varies. Some states have their own definition, and some states defer to the national uh, definition. So um, we have to have a recent examination of the animals. Uh, we have to be able to maintain medical records and that maintenance of medical records, what that is defined as is each state has their own definitions. So um, there are things that we have to ask for and information from you that we have to have in order to maintain those medical records to be legal in the state, to be able to have the entire VFD be legal. Um, we have to make sure that there's proper use of the medication, we have to be available for emergency and, and uh, follow-up care. And then we have to obviously issue a VFD that has all the information that's legally required. And we have to maintain that copy of the VFD for two years. So the reason I wanted to outline this to you guys is, is you know, a lot of times when I worked before, when I worked with, with producers and, and smaller producers, and, you know, they're like, look, you're asking me a lot of questions. And I recognize not everyone's comfortable with all the, you know, being able to provide all that information, or they wonder, why do you want to know all this stuff? And a lot of it's because my hands are tied. I'm required by law to maintain these records or I'm required by law to act this way in order for me to maintain my license. Um, and my license is my livelihood, so if I lose my license, that's a problem, right? And so I uh, just wanted to point out what we have to do, and it's not because we're trying to be intrusive, it's because we have to do that in order to maintain the license. So what are your responsibilities if you wanted to get uh, a VFD? Well, first of all, you have to 
Cooperate with the veterinarian and supply any, any information necessary. Again, I realize that that may be a little bit of a painful process or you may have questions about it, um, but ask the questions, right? And, and I'm happy to explain why I'm asking that. Um, so, so don't hesitate to, uh, to ask the questions if you, if you have those along the way. You're uh, agreeing to follow the dose rate, duration, and expiration date of the VFD. And people oftentimes, the most common questions I get when I, when I issue a VFD is what's the difference between duration of use and expiration? So the VFDs are usually, um, the default is a six month expiration, although most veterinarians will probably limit that. Um, I know in aquaculture, most of the, the vets and, and I do uh, a, a one month expiration date. So basically what that means is if I write a VFD, you have to feed that VFD drug within that month or before the expiration date is up. You have to complete the treatment. So if I wrote you a VFD today, uh, and so you, you know, I have a month, then you have 30 days in order to initiate and complete treatment. That's different than the, the duration of, uh, of use, which is that length of time that the feed is allowed to be fed, right? So before I was showing you those slides, and it was maybe a 10-day treatment or a five-day treatment, that's the duration of use. That's how long you're physically delivering the medicated feed to those animals. And that's defined. You can't be cutting it short and you can't go longer, right? It's the same way when you get a prescription filled an antibiotic, the doctor says complete, take all the antibiotics. If you feel better after three days, don't stop taking it, right? That helps contribute to, to antimicrobial resistance. So making sure that you guys are really following that duration of use and, and expiration date. And that's really important because um, to be honest, you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot if you don't do that. It, it may help on a, you know, you may be able to get away with it on a one pond basis or a raceway or whatever your tank or whatever your system is, but long term you could be providing an environment for antimicrobial resistance, which, which we don't want to do. And then with these new VFD rules, you used to work with a veterinarian to tell you how much feed you're going to get. That's no longer the case. You work with the feed mill directly and make that final determination of the amount of feed. And part of that has to do with how many animals, what their size is, growth rate, that kind of stuff. And you have to maintain a copy of the VFD for two years. So make sure you do that. Um, I was at a conference a couple months ago and, and there's an FDA inspector there and she was talking about all of her recent activity and increased activity in the aquaculture industry and going out and actually visiting uh, producers as well as the feed mills and veterinarians so make sure you're maintaining that copy. I have this up here because uh, I, I wasn't sure that I don't think there's any veterinarians and the veterinarians in the room already hopefully already know this but basically the, the, with the new, these new VFD rules it's, it's changed quite a bit um, a little bit with what we have to provide versus uh, what you as a producer so in essence they've they've cut out the veterinarian in, in some regards uh, we used to have to dictate a lot of different things, but in order to allow for some flexibility, they, they allowed the producer just to work directly with the feed mill. So uh, in summary, we all know aquaculture is, is, it is expanding globally. Uh, in the United States, it, it may be, um, uh, you know, the growth rates are different, but it is continuing to grow. There are very few antibiotics we can use in the United States, and there's very strict regulations of, of how we use those. Um, veterinarians are playing in more, more of a role in food fish production. Uh, a lot of this has to do with the VFD regulation, um, and I know it may be difficult for you to find a veterinarian who uh, can do more than just write a VFD, but please know there's some of us out there, and we're willing to help, and, and there are private veterinarians in the Midwest here that, that can not only get you a VFD, but work with you to make sure that your husbandry practices are correct, your water quality is correct, and you know, kind of go back to the basics and make sure that they're fixing the, helping you address the root causes. So, uh, and, and there's... Uh, a lot of opportunities that are available um, in, that, in that regard. But uh, anyway, so uh, that was a quick overview, but I just want to make you guys a little bit aware of what's out there, what's available, and, and what some of the regulations are um, for that. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, sir. Right, so the question is, is about uh, uh, returning or, or what to do with excess feed if you have uh, higher than expected mortality and, and you can't feed that, the, the full course of treatment or, or you, you do the whole course as far as days but you have some excess feed. And, and yes, and so the, that really that medicated feed should be returned to the feed mill. 
uh, or, or destroyed. And the actual destruction process or how you dispose of that, um, the feed mill can give you guidance. It varies by, by drug. Uh, so the, the, the safety data sheets, or SDS, formerly known as MSDSs, um, they'll, they'll have uh, stipulate in there how the properly dispose of the an an antibiotic. I mean, obviously for, so, you know, like for us, I make the farms return it to our feed mill. For you guys, I don't necessarily expect you to ship the food back uh, to the feed mill that you're getting it from. Um, but just recognize that you keeping it on the farm and delivering it to another group of animals is illegal. Uh, and, and again, I, not only is it illegal, but it, it help, it, that, that's creating an environment at your facility that you don't want to create. So um, just work with, the, work with the veterinarian or the feed mill to be able to tell you how to dispose of that medicated feed. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. But with fish, that's their environment. But is there an alternative to feed medi medicated feed? Yeah, so the question is about an alternative to medicated feed or how to deliver medications. And so um, there are, in that desk guide, we'll, we'll have other... So this was just focused on, on veterinary feed directives, uh, external treatments that you, you can deliver in the water. Um, they're not necessarily antibiotics. There are different chemicals to, to reduce the load of, of the bacteria. Uh, and those are available, those are legal, but there's limited options from an uh, antibiotic standpoint. Uh, in fish, it's all in the feed. Um, it's different when you're working with non-food fish, but with food fish and, and to maintain that, that food safety, uh, it is delivered in the feed. Um, so that's part of, too, where that INAD program comes into play to say, well, what are the other options that, that you can do? So, um, but I would say that you know, when you're dealing with a bacterial infection, there are other options that Desk Guide will explain what those are and what the limitations are for that. Yes, sir. I noticed in the video that you, you, your company primarily produces its own food, feed, shall I say. Mm -hmm. Fish no. Meal, well, I'm just, you yeah. Know, you know, fish meal primarily is um, those parts of the fish that have not been used. They used to do the same thing in the in the um, in the uh, cattle industry, right? Fact, which produced the concept of mad cow. Disease. Right. I used to work with a a company that uh, did slaughter, I mean, did cow slaughtering and stuff, rendering plants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They say they use everything in the cow except the moon and the fox. Now, with the fish, uh, your fish meal uh, byproduct is it is fed right back to the same to the fish that you're. That no, you're so yeah, so the question is is more about our our feed and and the fish meal and fish oil that's in the feed that was in that the the video. Um, so our fish meal and fish oil comes. Uh, not from within our own fish. Um, there are some exceptions, and part of that has to do with uh, GAABAP certification. They, they dictate that. Uh, there are some producers that, that use um, the offal from their processing plant to generate the fish meal or, or more of the fish oil to go back into their diets. And, and to address your question about the mad cow disease, so, so that's, that's caused by what's called a prion. It's a misfolded protein. Um, and so the idea is if that the, the cow is infected with that and then you use the offal from that to feed other cows that then can concentrate in animals and you can have mad cow disease. So I don't know of any prion disease in fish. Uh, someone can... Right, yeah, yeah. So, so there, there are prion diseases in other animals besides cows, uh, but I don't know of any prion disease to date that's been found in, in fish. And most of, our, most of the fish meal and fish oil globally is from wild capture fisheries. And so you're not having that cycle where it's your own animals that are generating the offal that's then being fed to your own animals where you can allow that environment for a concentration of that misfolded protein. Yeah. Stephen, but you did mention as a large company with an R&D, y'all are constantly looking at replacing fish meal and fish oil or just overall yeah, looking at all, other alternatives. Right, yeah, and so, and, and that, yeah, and that came up yesterday. People were asking, you know, people were asking about that, and, and so we do have, with our R&D and, and the research program, and we have a genetic stock. We've been genetically 
uh, selecting our fish for um, several decades and looking at growth rates, conversions, uh, acceptance to alternative protein sources, disease, disease resistance, those kind of things. And so um, we, there, you know, we are looking at that and we, we do explore other alternative protein sources. The, the problem with most of them, uh, particularly the plant-based ones, they have anti-nutritional factors that cause inflammation in the, in the GI tract, which uh, decreases the nutrient absorption uh, that you get. And so there are some ways around that and, and we're doing that. So, so yeah, we are looking at alternative protein sources. Um, but I, I guess I would say regardless of that, uh, I'm not particularly concerned and, uh, I'd be a little conservative since I'm on tape, but, uh, I, I'm not too particularly concerned of, of prion diseases. And that's not to say that they couldn't be an issue in the future, but to date, we don't know of any, uh, and we don't have any indication that they're present in the populations. Mm -hmm. When I lived in Idaho Falls, Idaho, and uh, you know, Snake River runs right through Idaho Falls, Idaho. Right? As a matter of fact. Yep. Yeah. And that's, you know, just curious. Yeah, sure. Any other questions before we go on? Yep, sure. Without sharing, it's like a trade secrets, but feed conversion. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and we can, we can get into, so we have a, a question and answer time too, at the end of the day that, that we can get into some of this, but, uh, yeah, the, the, the feed conversion ratios that we have, it's interesting. I have a, my, actually my roommate in vet school, uh, is a poultry vet now and, and he was out in, in, uh, in Idaho. And so we're taking him around the facility and, and I would say that our feed conversion ratios are, uh, equal to, if not below what, what the poultry industry is. Um, so we're, you know, anywhere from, we're, 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 we're less than two, let's say that. Um, and I, I guess I would caution you as well, and I just had made this comment earlier to someone we were talking about feed conversions. There's a lot of different ways to calculate feed conversion, okay? And, and so whether you're doing that gross or net, whether you're taking out mortality uh, or including mortality on that, so there's a lot of different ways you can calculate that uh, to get different numbers, if that makes sense. And we can talk more specifically offline, but, but yeah. I'm not uh, Dr. Kathleen. I can't uh, talk as uh, eloquent she, uh, eloquently as she does, uh, and um, I'm certainly not a veterinarian, so I'll go over what I can, and if you have questions at the end of it, if I can answer them, great. Uh, if Stephen's in the room, which he better be, or if Dr. Flint's in the room, which he better be, we'll make sure that we try to get your questions answered. Uh, at the very end, we will talk about CAPS, uh, which is an acronym, the Commercial uh, Aquaculture Health Program Standards, I believe. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about it that Kathleen's kind of heading the charge on, uh, but those will be, um, if it's super vague, I can try to answer that, but more specific stuff, uh, she'll have a lot more information on. Uh, but I already talked to you guys earlier, uh, Matt Smith is knowing your risk uh, from an aquaculture of farm biosecurity, and um, uh, if you were here last year, we hit quite a, uh, pretty hard on biosecurity, uh, and we tried to switch it up a little bit this year, but we certainly still got to talk about uh, the risk and, and the reasons why we need to uh, invest in something like a biosecurity plan. And most folks who are running a successful operation and, and who have been for a long time basically kind of have their own, even if it's not complete, they have in their mind at least some sort of biosecurity protocol uh, uh, and certain standards that they're going to have regardless, whether it be uh, disinfecting uh, nets, whether it be, um, you know, I'm not going to do agritourism because I don't want to risk bringing something in. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we do on a day-to-day -day practice, whether you physically have it written down or not. And I think Kathleen would urge you all to physically write it down and to physically educate everyone who's on your staff, whether it's just you or you and your wife, uh, so that everyone's kind of on the same page to help limit uh, risk with your operation. Um, aquaculture is already risky enough. <laughs> Why not do your best to prevent stuff from happening in the, uh, in the first place? So biosecurity, there's certainly no silver bullet for this, uh, but it is all going to be about, uh, this presentation is, as it says in the title, all about managing our risks. Um, it's certainly going to be preventative. Uh, we always talk about the, uh, you know, prevention being the key. It's so much cheaper and easier than worrying about the cure. Uh, and as we saw, you know, most operations are uh, or, or for everybody, the antibiotic should be the absolute very last protocol or very last thing that you have to do. Uh, but if you do happen to get uh, a veterinarian uh, to check fish and you do come back with something, are you, you know, really, if they're not going to get better without something like an antibiotic, what are you uh, going to do? And understanding 
my market says absolutely nothing, well, you got to understand that you're going to lose a substantial number of fish and, uh, and kind of lose a huge percentage of those. Um, do you go ahead, uh, take them out, and, and dispose of them beforehand? Do you risk going through, or do you actually go through uh, and get an antibiotic? But having all of this preventative measures set in place to help limit the chance of ever needing something like that certainly uh, certainly going to be preferred. But it's obviously a health management strategy. Um, and then it's going to be a result of careful assessment and planning. And Kathleen, sorry, I don't like standing behind here too much. Kathleen calls it uh, a three-step process. And so that's most of what this presentation will be about. <clears throat> So first, we're going to focus on managing your risks. So what are the risks uh, to your farm? And some of this is, I mentioned the stress management um, at every stop. So a lot of this hits the same stuff that we talked about and discussed earlier. Uh, but specifically, as she breaks down three separate things, but spe specifically to your farm. Uh, and this, of course, gets more to uh, an outside operation. But uh, if you do have a large creek or a stream that's next to it, uh, next to your operation where your effluent um, ends up going to, um, what happens if you do have extreme flooding, and especially in southern Ohio, but we see some extreme flooding uh, where ponds can certainly overflow, uh, and you can have your own product end up downstream, uh, but just the other way, we, can, we also need to be equally worried about what type of pathogens, uh, even though they're fairly ubiquitous in the environment, what type of pathogens might be in that lake, stream, reservoir, whatever that's right beside you that floods over onto your farm. So you might have a perfectly healthy stock uh, or at least a, a stock that's fairly uh, stress-free or, or limited on stress uh, because you're, you've been maintaining good water quality and really have good husbandry practices. That doesn't really mean anything if your operation's not set up to succeed even when uh, you know, Mother Nature decides to downpour right next to you. Uh, specifically to your disease, um, how are you going to manage those risks, uh, whether it be pathogens or predators, and I kind of hit on that earlier, so I won't discuss too much, uh, but I did talk about uh, managing risks or, or uh, specifically to your business, focusing on the costs, the regulations, the market access, and, and things of that nature. And that gets into more of, um, it gets into more of aquaculture already being a risky business. So do your best to be preventative because if you're just kind of willy-nilly about how things go, you can spend a whole bunch of money and I'm sure Stephen can tell you how expensive her trout feed is. It would be a crying shame from the time they were hatched all the way until right before they, uh, before they became market size. Uh, and then you don't have some sort of biosecurity protocol in and you lose these basically food fish that are ready to go to market next week or the week after. And you've just spent um, nine to 15 months going through and, and basically getting these animals ready to market and losing those animals. Uh, not only is that really expensive on the food side, but also you have a market that is hopefully really relying upon your product. And uh, the one time you can't make uh, good on your word, unless you've been with them for a very long time, uh, you very well may lose that market access uh, pretty quickly. So with risk to your animals, uh, what species are you culturing, the system that you're using, and then for what end use, uh, which once again, we discussed some of this earlier, uh, but if you wanna look at what species you're culturing, some are certainly gonna be more prone to uh, pathogens uh, or there are species specific pathogens that are going to take hold of some animals and not others. Uh, we do discuss and, and we saw some pictures earlier of a, of a few costier or, or a few parasites on, uh, on an animal. Ten parasites may mean nothing on a large largemouth bass, but if you get 10, 15, or 20 on a tiny little goldfish, uh, that all of a sudden what the same number of, of costia or or whatever lernia or whatever anchorworm, whatever type of parasite you're worrying about on a small animal uh, may mean a lot more impact and have a lot more of a negative impact than it does on a much larger animal. Um, and I reference Arkansas a lot because I haven't done any fish disease stuff since I've been here, but it was uh, extremely common to where we had um, uh, very, very small fish, which would uh, basically be negligible number of, uh, of parasites on a much larger fish, but because it's a really small animal, it is more of a chronic irritant, and they uh, they do end up losing some animal or losing some fish uh, for more of a, a parasite reason. But it's also I mentioned more of a combination thing. It's probably a little bit of an irritant from a parasite. It's also a little bit of a poor water quality, and then you go through and harvest them. Uh, there's a lot of stressors uh, focused there, so it's not just species, but it's size of that animal as well. 
Uh, and then, of course, some systems are just going to be a little bit riskier than others. Uh, while pond systems, depending on where you are and who builds the ponds, uh, while pond systems can be uh, a cheaper way to go through and build and, and, and to move product and be cheaper overall, uh, and you can lower your break even, uh, a lot of times with a pond system, you're also a lot riskier in a sense that you are exposed to the elements. So here are th her three risk uh, evaluations for biosecurity planning. So we're looking at identification, characterization, and management. And we'll dive into all three of these. Uh, but with identification, um, we need to worry, of course, that we've got specific species, as we just discussed. You've got to be able to prioritize these pathogens, because we're not, if we worried about literally everything that was uh, on our fish constantly, um, we wouldn't be able to get anything else done. And once again, there are a great deal of fairly ubiquitous and fairly benign things that are in the environment. Uh, and we've got to understand uh, that if we can help limit the stress with good water quality by starting out with good quality animals, uh, and by prioritizing the pathogens and not worrying about literally everything that's in that water, we can really uh, prioritize ourselves and our farms as well. You got to characterize, so your CCP is your critical control point, so where that uh, entry and spread is going to occur. And I mentioned earlier, um, almost all of you were on uh, the bus tour the other day, and uh, it was really uh, nice to see biosecurity protocols in place at some of the facilities, and they discussed the uh, utilizing the Vircon, and if the, the, the person leaves the operation uh, or leaves the farm uh, in a truck, they're not allowed to come back without uh, utilizing the entire gallon of Vircon. And things like that are just things that people may just put and in, in, in kind of they know themselves, but unless it's on paper and everyone's kind of mandated to follow the same process, that one-week link really, uh, really makes it kind of pointless to do anything which does make it difficult when you do want to focus on something like agritourism. I think it's super cool and I think it's great, but it also uh, should at least be understood that, uh, especially as you rear these animals in a high density, that you do increase the likelihood of potentially entering in a pathogen that's not already there. And then as far as managing, um, you of course want to prevent and control the entry and spread, which gets back to the CCPs. And then just physically going through and documenting, that not just having these in your head, that's the same thing with water quality. It drives me crazy. Someone will check DO every day, but if nothing's written down, it's just kind of a trend line in their mind, not necessarily something that's physically down on paper so that we can go back and reference to later. It's the same thing with water quality or biosecurity plan. If it's just kind of uh, loosey-goosey, there's everything's going to fall through the cracks, and then it just makes it pointless and makes it really difficult to help pinpoint where something went wrong if, uh, if CCPs aren't identified and a, and a protocol is not down. So first you of course got to identify what's going on. A lot of times vets um, uh, and, and places like the Animal Disease Diagnostics Lab will help you identify these. Um, the species specific stuff that you're worried about, uh, you may not be worried about everything. Um, you know, if you've got spring ramia carp uh, that you're worrying about with carp, um, if you're, and a lot, a lot of times you see that with state associate, or states that you're trying to import into, it's never been proven that this specific animal can even get this specific disease, but we're going to make you pay for testing that uh, anyways. So we want to prioritize and do things not in a redundant fashion, but understand uh, tilapia is going to be in particularly susceptible to things like uh, tilapia lake virus, a bunch of aromona species, mycobacterium, flavobacterium, and things like that. But we want to focus on not just looking for everything and and that's where having uh, our vet class that we had, our fish vet class yesterday, is to help train some of these people who are just interested in maybe even small or large animals, just get them at least somewhat familiar with, um, uh, with fish and understand where some resources are because we don't want them to waste a whole bunch of time, sorry, a whole bunch of time and energy uh, uh, looking or testing for stuff that uh, a species can't even get. And of course, some of the stuff we're going to be worried about with um, and, and there are, of course, plenty of clinical signs that uh, Dr. Google can show up, as Stephen likes to say, but uh, with largemouth bass, we don't want to be worried about something that, uh, uh, that's very low on our prioritization list. And then, of course, it's going to go from really bad to just bad, uh, and everyone's uh, fairly aware, with, uh, especially with Lake Erie what, uh, and our Great Lakes, what uh, VHS is or viral hemorrhagic septicemia is going to be a bigger problem uh, than something like Aramonas, because One's going to be OIE reportable, and if it's found, it has to be reported to the proper, proper authorities. And then, of course, that gets down to a whole bunch of nitty-gritty stuff that uh, we hope uh, no one ever has to come to the farm for. 
But we got to understand then that we're uh, we need to prioritize our time because people need to physically go through and raise these animals at some point, not just be testing water quality and worrying about biosecurity. <clears throat> Uh, the second one is the characterization, as I mentioned. Uh, what's the level of risk? So you got to trust, uh, and that's where trusting uh, your supplier really comes into play. Uh, understanding where your egg source is or where your fingerlings are coming from. Most often, uh, more often here in Ohio, it's uh, uh, where, the, where the fingerlings are coming from. Is the source water protected? If not, VHS uh, or could VHS get in through the water, which is why um, most of our operations, unless you're in extremely small hobby scale and you can afford to just use some treated uh, city water, uh, most of us are going to use uh, uh, focus on deep water wells. Uh, I'm not sure if we get into it much later on, but uh, I, I know I talked pretty heavily about it yesterday. Um, a fairly deep well, we may have the problems with high carbon dioxide, ammonia problems, low DO, supersaturation, or some of those types of things. But that stuff's fairly easy to remove from a situation with just things like a degassing tower, which is very common in certain areas, to go through and kind of clean that water up and make the water quality source a lot better before it ever enters, the, enters our operation. It's a whole lot easier to go through and degas water as it is to try to run it through filtrations and UV uh, sterilization before it ever comes onto your operation. Uh, so it's uh, safer and cheaper for everybody uh, to use the correct source, um, uh, the correct source of water. And then in particular, if pathogen X, uh, whatever it may be, gets on the farm, how's it gonna spread around? Are you gonna use SANES personnel? Uh, and that's where all of your protocols come into play. <clears throat> we see it, uh, I guess, a little bit here in Ohio, but uh, in particular down south, we have a lot of very, very large operations that don't even have their own seine crews. They physically hire out another crew, and that's all they do is seine fish up all day long, and they may move, and they do move from farm to farm to farm, so how do you go through and properly disinfect, whether it be through uh, Vercon, just letting the net sit out in the sun for X number of days, uh, all of these sorts of things to go through and, and help uh, have to be followed in order to limit spread from uh, either, either one side of the, the operation to another or between ponds or uh, in between farms. She always shows this one. One of these days I'm going to memorize it so we don't have to pull it up. But uh, Dr. Kathleen likes to talk about prioritization with their pathogens uh, in these five areas. So you, of course, can uh, have trouble with your animals, your water, your feed or your food, uh, the vectors, and then the fomites. Uh, so you need to develop that plan, and once again, it may be something that's in your head or loosely in your head or something you're seeing uh, in this presentation for the first time, but if you don't physically go back and write it down and follow it down, it's kind of null and void. So uh, take a lot of the stuff that Dr. Kathleen uh, and Dr. Flint and Dr. Reichley say to heart uh, and go through and help develop something that will help uh, keep your farm uh, safe. And then risk mitigation, so uh, how do you prevent the spread entry? Um, documenting these practices, once again, get it out of your head and on a piece of paper, uh, really make up the biosecurity plan. Uh, and you do have to justify uh, each practice. So uh, she put, e.g., uh, facility uses 1% Vercon for net uh, dips due to the risk of bacterial pathogen before, uh, between tanks. Um, and then her other one was facility treats incoming water with UV sterilization for VHS. Uh, but why are you doing it and relaying the message as to why you're doing this and, and how do you help uh, ensure that everyone gets the same message on to why, uh, why this is a concern and why, why we're doing what we're doing it. We're not doing it just because, we're doing it for a reason. Uh, and I mentioned earlier, you know, Stephen's operation is 100% employee owned. Everyone better have, everyone does have some stock in the company and some, and some kind of skin in the game, so it makes sense for everyone to be on the same page as far as uh, how the best management practices need to be coordinated and everyone needs to know how to do everything, uh, at least from a biosecurity standpoint, and what to do if X happens or if Y happens. The protocols better be the same and better be written down. But it's all about managing risks. Uh, so what about managing uh, animal health? So this gets into Kathleen's super specific stuff that she likes focusing on, but they do have a, a beautiful graph that they have here. Uh, that's been head up by USDA APHIS, and she discussed in great detail on this last year. Um, but it is a comprehensive health management of the livestock. It's developed with the industry, but most uh, importantly, even though USDA APHIS kind of headed the charge and has funded some projects to look at uh, various types of um, not only implementing caps onto uh, operations as test sites, um, but also 
in investigating, the USDA APHIS spent money investigating the cost of regulations on various types of operations or various types of industries, including trout, including catfish, including bait and sport fish and shellfish. Um, I don't think they spent any money, but other folks have spent money particularly investigating the cost of regulations on aquaponics. So this basically what we've seen is a whole bunch of regulations have stemmed uh, and I'm wanting to say, I, I should have looked at it before I got up here, but I asked Steve, or I uh, asked uh, my buddy Jonathan how many individual regulations he saw on a farm. Uh, and I think the most they saw individual regulations, I think, was maybe five or six hundred, something like that. But these are extremely large operations that are sending product all over the country and really all over the world. Um, but an extreme amount of regulation. So CAPS is built with the industry in mind. And it is non-regulatory, so they're, it's, they're, they're not the government and they're here to help. It's helped to kind of uh, use uh, the industry and be developed with the industry. But the goal is to help uh, with the oversight and the documentation. And I think she gets to it in a, in a minute, but a lot of it has to deal with, and it doesn't have to be because uh, there can be a lot involved here, but a lot of it has to deal with more of the, the bait and sport fish industry and physically transporting these live animals across state lines. Uh, well, this state might require 60 fish to be tested for VHS. This test, um, and I'm just using examples, I'm not a vet, but um, this other state might require 120, or if you're going into Canada, it might be this number of fish. Uh, so just our, try to standardize some of this stuff because it is extremely expensive uh, from both the direct costs, not so much a direct cost, but more of an indirect cost to the farmers and the amount of time and effort that they have to spend. So if you're extremely small and never cross state lines, it's less of a concern for you uh, compared to if you're trying to expand or you're already into a bunch of states. That's where CAPS can really play a good role into helping facilitate and what the goal I think ultimately is, is to get a bunch of states to adopt kind of the CAP standards rather than each state physically coming up with their own set of regs and rules for, for importation and transporting fish. Here we can kind of say, all right, these two states are a part of CAPS. I already know what they need because my state does the same and this state does the same. It just makes things a whole lot smoother rather than being terrified uh, that I'm going to cross into this um, this other state and risk having the Lacey Act and things like that uh, brought upon us. Uh, but CAPS involves uh, uh, these five tiers right here, uh, but you have an aquatic animal health team that uh, has all the knowledge and the skills, or a, a good bit of the knowledge of the skills. You've got to have your risk evaluation and it better be science-based and um, you, you better have a solid method behind uh, how CAPS is, is implemented, so this pro how this program is implemented how the biosecurity falls underneath uh, the risk evaluation, uh, and I won't go through, but all of the rest under there. They tried to simplify it because going between state and state and uh, not knowing is really expensive. So this is their entire site-specific health plan, which is obviously not very clear, um, but it's, I, I would say, clearer than um, what some of these farmers are having to go through on a daily basis, especially some of the larger folks anyways. So I won't go too far into it, but you have as we mentioned, your health team, your risk evaluation, your surveillance, your disease uh, investigation plan, and your response plan. And the good thing is, is there is a health team, so it's not just one person doing this all on your own. If CAP starts to get developed, uh, there's a whole host of folks willing to help the farmers be successful, and you're not doing it all on your own. So why do CAPS? It's assurance of health on the farm uh, of, of your raised aquatic animals. So she's wanting to lower the risk for specific diseases directly because you physically have a, a written biosecurity and surveillance plan. Uh, it facilitates animal trade and movement. So that's your getting, uh, if you are a Pond Lake management company or even if you're just trying to sell uh, live tilapia in this state and move to another state uh, to sell the ornamental or the Asian markets, same thing can be concerned, uh, you can be concerned about, but that animal trade and movement, uh, so it helps with uh, international trade, which of course is less of a problem for us, but it more so helps reduce hurdles for interstate transportation. Helps uh, increase uh, public trust, and I think that's kind of the ultimate goal, is if, uh, you know, it's the, whether it's the GAA, BAP stamp of approval or the CAP stamp of approval, uh, but uh, marketing really goes a long way uh, coming from Arkansas, we had the Arkansas Certified Safe Bait, so we know that we know that if you buy uh, this particular bait fish from that state and they're under this and they have this logo on it, they've gone through this rigor rigorous standing just to be able to, uh, to sell you the product in the first place. And it certainly complements other programs based on the business's goal, um, uh, whether that be biosecurity, food safety, certification programs, and animal welfare. 
Um, biosecurity and surveillance practices, you got to do both um, to help with the, uh, uh, ensure a healthy farm. Uh, and that's where she gets into the CAPS being a uniform standard uh, to help minimize. And we often say a lot of times there's, there are some farmers that just absolutely hate regulations, but a lot of times it's going to be hating the necessary or the redundant or the unnecessary or the redundant regulations that really don't benefit or or make anything better. All it does is inhibit the, the farm's ability to do business, I think is, is what she likes to focus on here is CAPS can help hopefully streamline some of the processes. There's our information. If you have any questions, let her know. If not, uh, if, if I can do anything or, or Stephen or Mark or anyone here, uh, any questions? Uh, well, he's working on that. So yeah, so we're gonna. I'm gonna talk a little bit about common diseases. So a little, uh, some pretty pictures and, and those kind of things. Um, different diseases that we see in cultured fish. Again, this is really difficult to. Let's see. They gave me 40 minutes for this. Uh, it's hard to compress all the diseases in 40 minutes. So please recognize this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, but I tried just picking out the the highlights based on the the common species that are cultured in the United States. Uh, hopefully some of you are raising some of these fish and um, for the species I don't include, it's not anything against this, your, your species that you're raising. Uh, I just tried picking some of the big ones. So I just want to point out, uh, start from the beginning, I guess, of, of globally and big picture, uh, aquatic diseases. So basically what this, this graph is, is it looks at uh, estimated cost um, of the di of the disease uh, outbreak, and then and then years at the bottom here. So you can see that that foot and mouth uh, outbreak, SARS, you know, over here, the avian flu. So the different years when those uh, diseases occurred, and then and then their basically their economic impact. And uh, suffice it to say that the aquatic diseases or diseases of aquatic organisms uh, are increasing. Uh, part of that is because we as we intensify the culture. Um, and, and recognize the different diseases that this is an evolving and, and changing uh, topic. So um, I think a lot of producers, when I first started with aquaculture in vet school, so I knew nothing about fish prior to vet school, um, I used to do orthopedic surgery, so back and knee surgery on dogs came across the fish. Uh, but my first experience with fish was actually here at ODA. Uh, Dr. Forshee hired me on as, a, as an intern uh, in their uh, aquaculture division. So I spent my first summer break with uh, the aquaculture coordinator for the state of Ohio, driving all over the state and visiting farms and whatnot. And um, I guess I'm not sure if it's my, because my interest has expanded and I met more people that I've become more and more uh, aware of the diseases or if the diseases are uh, increasing in prevalence. But um, just recognizing that this is, this is an area that, that you're gonna have to deal with at some point. If you uh, haven't already, great. But part of that goes back to Dr. Hartman's um, talk that he so eloquently, oh, wait, that Matt so eloquently presented for her, uh, uh, biosecurity, right? And so ideally you want to try and prevent the diseases to begin with, but um, recognize that they're there. So the way I was trained, we're going to lump these, these diseases into different uh, pathogen types. So we'll start with some of the bacterial diseases. Uh, so these are diseases that are caused by bacteria. This is... Uh, Abnormal. Uh, this is a catfish. Okay, so this is Edwardsiella ictoluri is the bacteria that causes it. Big fancy Latin term, but basically we used to get calls from producers. My fish got the hole in the head, right? So enteric septicemia of catfish. It causes this really characteristic lesion. This is the these are the, the eyes. This is the head of the of the catfish, and basically it's a severe ulceration uh, that goes all the way down into the open fontanelle. It's interesting because this, this disease actually starts with infecting the brain. It's a meningioencephalitis uh, that works its way out and eats away the skin uh, as it goes. So um, this is a, a major, this is probably one of the biggest diseases in the, in the catfish industry down in, in the south. Uh, the southeast of, of catfish is, is dealing with, uh, with this, this disease. Um, they use antimicrobials and, and medicated feed for it, and, and uh, there's a lot of efforts for uh, an effective vaccine to help diminish the impact. And um, when I was finishing up my time at Mississippi State, uh, what, about a year and a half ago now, uh, they were just coming out with uh, a new vaccine for this that was looking very, very promising that was 
actually delivered in the feed, um, which was helpful when you talk vaccines, it becomes difficult when you stock a 20 acre pond, how do you vaccinate all of those fish? So in the feed was actually a, a, a robust, way, robust way to do it, particularly when the fish isn't sick, they're eating very well. Um, this this uh, pathogen's also been found more recently in tilapia and, uh, and in zebrafish and a couple other fish species. And it's probably not that it hasn't been there in the past, it's more that we're becoming uh, better at detecting it and there's more diagnostics being done. This is another Edwards Ziella species. So this is the problem that we have is um, in the catfish industry we used to have all these cases coming in of ESC and, and uh, the, the farmer would be either choose to treat medicated feed. There's actually some research done that shows they can stop feeding and it's somewhat uh, efficacious. Some will argue with you anecdotally that it's more efficacious than medicated feed. That's because it's an enteric pathogen, so it's spread through the gut. So if you feed the fish, or you stop feeding the fish, then they're not defecating as much, and therefore they're not shedding the bacteria. So you're decreasing the overall pathogen load in the pond. So a lot of farmers will just take their fish off of feed. The problem becomes is a lot of farmers brought his cases, said, hey, I got a hole in the head, right? This one looks a little bit different, but it's just a different fish. It presented different ways, but you see this big hole, and they say, I got ESC. Um, then we found out that there's a new species of Edwards yellow, surprise, uh, which was great and it was good for me because this is what I did my dissertation on. So four years spent on characterizing this one bacteria. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but the, the difference here from a, from a producer standpoint is chronic mortality. So ESC, you would see this huge uptick of mortality and it'd be, it'd be somewhat acute and go back down. But with Pisocyta, you actually see it chronically. So you're kind of nickeled and dimed every day. So you as a producer, they say, oh, I'm not really losing that many fish. And, it's difficult because, again, they have a 20-acre pond. They don't go pick their morts every day. Uh, but, you know, you lose three or four fish. You say, ah, it's only three or four fish. Who cares? But if it's three or four fish every day for 30 days, now that's, you know, that's, that's a big cumulative effect. So um, that, that's something that, uh, that they're working on right now and, again, looking to see. In fact, this one, we did some research to show the vaccine for Edwards yellow ictillary provides some protection against Pisocytum. This is a, a common disease, so again, if you we go back and look at the other talk that I gave, uh, if you were awake for that one, we, you'll so notice that Flavobacterium columnari was on that list of some of the medicated feed uh, diseases. So this is, this, the Flavobacteria species, or Flavobacterium, the genus of, of bacteria is uh, ubiquitous in the environment. So if I go to your farm and I look at your water, I'm probably going to find Flavo in it. Um, the difficult thing too is they keep changing the name. Uh, Flavobacterium, what we used to call columnari, researchers are now telling us that that's actually four different species of Flavobacterium. Which you say, okay, that's academic, right? And, and maybe they're splitters versus lumpers. But the problem becomes is when you're trying to develop a vaccine, if you pick a different, you pick a specific isolate, you call it columnari, but really it's something else, it may be efficacious or it may not. Or the, what you have, what you're, the pathogen you're dealing with, Instead of calling it columnari, it may be this other flavo. So it actually has applied implications, but it makes things challenging. Um, what you see in the picture at the top here, this is actually a very cl common presentation. They call it saddleback disease. Okay, so you basically you see this, this lesion, this discoloration, more specifically a uh, lightening in color uh, of the skin, basically where you would put a saddle if you chose to put a saddle on a salmonid. Uh, that's where it would go. You also see fin, uh, fin rot and, and cigar mouth. So cigar mouth, uh, uh, we saw that a lot in catfish. If, if you have a mouth that that's, uh, uh, you get a bunch of gross crap on it, okay? And, and uh, if you see uh, yellow in the lesion anywhere on the fish, so you know, you have little ulcers or these round sores on it and they have some yellow coloration around them or yellow coloration around the mouth, that's very indicative of a flavo uh, a flavo in infection. Um, in fact, that's one of the clinical signs that we use uh, to, to reach a preliminary diagnosis uh, to use some of those external treatments that were in the guide and, uh, and or the medicated feed. Um, it's difficult probably for you guys to tell, but when in, in the lab we were talking about the, the skin scrapes and gill clips. Um, this is one of the bacteria that you can actually diagnose using the microscope on the skin scraper gill clip and you see these haystack bacteria. Uh, Flavobacterium, the, the genus used to be called Flexibacter. So it looks like a haystack and the, the bacteria will actually flex. Okay, so you can see that on a wet mount. 
uh, and that's that we use that as a preliminary diagnosis, uh, and that's that's pretty common when you when you see that to be able to culture the the Flavobacterium columnare. So these are just some pictures. Uh, I won't tell you where that rainbow trout picture came from. I'll tell you I took it. <laughs> so again, when you're looking at the gills, uh, you hopefully can appreciate the yellow color to that. You see some white in the gills and you can maybe appreciate that some of the gills are missing. Just really yellow necrotic gills. Um, usually the flavos too are a secondary pathogen, so maybe something else has uh, caused a problem in the fish and the flavos just said, hey look, there's a free ride, I'll hop on that. and. Uh, start uh, eating away some of the gills there. This is a picture of that cigar mouth that I was talking about where you kind of see yellow sores uh, around the, the mouth of the fish. Okay, another Flavo, Flavobacterium cycrophyllum. So uh, for those Latin scholars in the room, cycrophyllum is cold loving. So this is a bacterial cold water disease. You see this in, in, the, in the cold or cool water species, whereas columnaris can infect cold and warm water uh, species alike. They don't discriminate. This is, uh, like I say here, mostly an issue in salmonids just because of cold water, but it has a, a tremendously large uh, host range. And, and what you see in, in cold water disease, in, in, a little bit in contrast to the saddleback that we saw in culinary, you'll actually see this. This is a classical presentation where you see the, basically the missing uh, or necrotic uh, uh, fin here in the back, right? And so, uh, and, and sometimes it can actually impact everything that's behind the dorsal fin where you just see it as lightning in color back here and maybe sometimes columnaria might hop on or, or fungus might hop on there. So, uh, the tricky part about cycrophyllum, and we see this uh, with, with some frequency, you can have a bunch of mortality uh, in your fry without any clinical signs. Uh, makes it fun to see because then you try and figure out what that is. And again, that goes back to some of you I was talking to about, you had questions about fish and some health problems you're having. It's difficult to be able to help you uh, unless we can culture it because really the only definitive way to diagnose this is, is with culture. But again, I won't disclose the location of these pictures, but you'll see a, this caudal, what we call the caudal peduncle here, and you hopefully can appreciate the lightening of the color back here. And, uh, and basically, that's, you just get all this necrosis, cell death back here, and, and the fins start getting frayed. And like I said, un, not uncommonly, you'll see uh, yellow color back here of, of columnari or other flavos hopping on. And you also see these, uh, these dorsal ulcerations that occur very commonly immediately behind the dorsal fin. That's another common presentation of, of bacterial cold water disease or flavocycrophilum. Okay, I'm sick of talking about flavos, but there's another one. Flavobacterium uh, branchiophyllum, the gills, loving the gills. So this is bacterial gill disease. Again, it's usually an issue in salmonids, but really wide host range. And basically what you can see here, and again, it's not um, specific to this disease, but you can hopefully appreciate what's happening here is, and it may be a little bit hard to tell, but the opercula or that gill plate on this side of the fish is, is closer to the body, it's kind of normal, whereas this one's protruding out, okay? So this one, um, that's more of an indication that something is wrong with the gills. Something is added to the gills that normally shouldn't be there. And, uh, and so you see this um, with this pathogen, but also parasites or, or other things can, can cause this kind of presentation. And basically, the fish presents in our fancy term respiratory distress, right? So. Um, what does that mean? That means the fish are usually accumulated in the area of your culture system that has the cleanest water or the fastest moving water. They're trying to get to an area where they can increase the chance of them being able to get some oxygen. They may be piping at the surface, they may be um, in our, our raceways, they'd be up to the top of the raceway instead of toward the back. They're doing everything they can to try and find oxygen because they rely on passive diffusion of oxygen from the water into the gills. All right, enough of the flavos. We'll go on to the uh, modal aeromonas. So this is one, and uh, if you have any diagnostic work done in your fish, um, it wouldn't be uncommon for them to culture this. Uh, this is traditionally thought of as uh, a bacterial pathogen that's more environmental and not necessarily a primary cause of mortality. Although in the catfish industry a couple of years ago, we started seeing 80 to 90% mortality in our market fish. So we spent all this money investing into the fish and 
a couple months before they reach market size, you could lose 80% of those fish uh, within a two-day time period. Tremendous, tremendous economic loss uh, for those, those producers down there. Um, but like it shows here, this is people will claim that this is the most common bacterial disease in freshwater fish. So it's not necessarily, uh, like I said, sometimes it's difficult for me. I tend to be more conservative when I, when I culture this from a fish. Um, I don't necessarily say that's the cause of mortality. We have to kind of take the whole clinical picture. But you can see this is a catfish down here. Uh, again, a swollen belly. This is going to be full with fluid. $10 veterinary term for that is ascites. Uh, and you see some hemorrhage here of that. And that's a common presentation along with these kind of small ulcers that are over the, the body surface. Uh, I put down here that's a zoonotic concern. So for those of you who are not familiar with that term, that means that's a disease that you can get as well. Okay. So this is something that um, if your fish have, you could potentially get it too. It's not usually a, a big concern it's, you know, unless you're immunocompromised or those kind of things, but it is a, a pathogen that, uh, that doesn't discriminate between fish or people. Another Aramonis that, uh, that we deal with, and those of you maybe raising Salmonids deal with, is, is Aramonis salmonicida. It's technically Aramonis salmonicida, subspecies salmonicida. I got a PhD, so I got to put these fancy things up here, right? Um, this is bronchiolosis disease, okay? And, and so hopefully you can appreciate that picture in the bottom. If you have a fish that looks like that, there's a problem. Yes? Okay. The problem is they don't always get those furuncles or those ulcers like that. So you don't necessarily have to have those. And the tricky part with this pathogen is that it can be uh, acute or chronic disease or latent, meaning that they can be infected with, with Aramonis salmonicida, subspecies salmonicida, and uh, have no clinical presentation, and then spread that to all their friends when they get stressed. So when you guys are grading the fish or moving the fish or any of that kind of stuff, uh, this bug could pop up. It doesn't mean that you didn't have it before. It just means that the fish were stressed and, and now it's causing a problem. All right, Rennie bacterium. So uh, this, hopefully you guys, now after this morning, uh, and I know this is zoomed in, but this is a kidney uh, along the, the fish, and, and you can see there, I've made some basically some cuts into it. Um, this was some time, <coughs> excuse me, this is when I was uh, working for Idaho Fish and Game and we were doing some surveillance work for um, bacterial uh, kidney disease in, in the returning Chinook salmon. But you can appreciate hopefully all this white uh, nodules that are in the kidney there. And that's uh, basically those, again the fancy term we use for those are granulomas, but basically they're small white little, it's kind of like peppercorns, okay, but they're white uh, throughout the kidney. Um, and then you also could see some, some different uh, granulomas in the heart here as well. Uh, and so this actually can lead to very significant cumulative losses. And the important thing here is vertical transmission, which means that the fish get sick from their parents. Okay? So uh, depending upon the source of your eggs, the brood stock could be sharing the love with their babies, and their babies could get sick thanks to the parents. These things that you're talking about, do they affect other things besides uh, trout and salmon? Like, like yeah, bass or right. So the question becomes, yeah, is what, what species? And, and so some of these do, a lot of these pathogens will. And again, that's where I said some of these are, these, a lot of these are salmonids, like ERM is, is a salmonid disease. But a lot of the flavos and, and uh, aeromonids cer certainly don't discriminate at all um, between that. So you can see uh, these diseases in other fish species as well. Yeah, but when I set up here, if it says primarily a, a, an issue in cultured salmonids, it's usually a salmonid disease, uh, but it, it could be other, other fish as well. Yeah. So ERM, this is uh, enteric red mouth uh, disease. Again, this is significant losses in all life stages. Um, this pretty much was a huge impediment to the trout industry back in the 60s and 70s. Um, the nice thing is, is that there's a really easy uh, and, and cheap vaccine that you can give. It's very efficacious. This is, there's a va the vaccine for this is kind of the gold standard. Everyone, when you have a bacterial problem, they want to get a vaccine, and they try to emulate this vaccine, but it's challenging to do with, with other pathogens. And it's actually the first fish vaccine that was licensed in the United States. Okay, Francisella. <clears throat> there's two different uh, subspecies of nuanciensis. Uh, it, it depends upon whether you have a tropical or, or temperate. So for those of you that raise tilapia, time to wake up. Uh, Francisella could be present in your fish. 
Um, I have some fancy terms up here. Basically, this is a uh, gram negative. It's the way that we, when we do diagnostics to differentiate, and it's a cacobacillus, means it's kind of a difference between a coccyx, which is a ball, and a bacillus, which is a rod. So it's kind of a weird shaped bacteria when you look at it. Uh, it's interesting because it's, inter it's a facultative intracellular. So you say, I've got sick fish. You take it to the lab or you have a veterinarian come look and we culture it. And uh, you, know, you start wondering, what am I paying all this money for the lab to do? I could do that. This one's really difficult to grow. Uh, and it, it takes, it's challenging to do that. And, and uh, basically what you would see in the fish, and again, it's challenging because this is not the only disease that presents like this, you see those white peppercorns again. And you'll see that all the way throughout the entire, uh, it could be just one organ impacted, uh, or it could be multiple organs impacted. It depends upon how long that fish has had it. But basically you see this, these granulomas all throughout the fish. Um, a differential for this or another disease that could cause this is a mycobacterium. So mycobacterium, again, this is another one that's very difficult to grow. Uh, I was working with some producers uh, actually here in the Midwest that had some mycobacterium issues. Uh, and it takes, it could take a couple of weeks for this bacteria to grow on the plate for the diagnostic lab to say you have this problem. This is really challenging. and. Uh, the problem with myco, it's zoonotic, okay? So you can get it. In fact, when you hear of fish handler's disease, it's caused by this bacteria. And uh, when you get it, that's not good. The treatment is depopulation and disinfection. So bye-bye to all of your fish. And uh, disinfection is not as simple as spraying some bleach on your tanks and scrubbing them down. Think about all of the pipes that you have. These bacteria form what's called a biofilm and they accumulate on the inside of, of uh, your pipes. And so there are systems that, uh, uh, that this has been diagnosed in where we took all the fish out and uh, took the entire system out. They started from scratch. Um, this is something that you don't want to don't want to deal with, uh, and again, this presents with all these granulomas. So when you open up the fish and you see all those white nodules in the internal organs, um, that's something certainly to to be concerned about. And maybe that's when you you say, hey, I need to get some professional help or have someone else look at these fish to make sure that I don't have myco. What happens when a human gets? Yeah, so what happens when a human gets myco? So it's, it, it, it causes um, the granulomatous disease, or it causes these nodules on your hands typically. So usually when, when a human gets it, it's because you're working with the fish and you have a scratch on your hand or, or something like that. So it's usually a localized uh, infection, and it stays localized. Uh, it can be a problem, though, with people who, who are immunocompetent, um, and that could be an issue. Uh, I'm certainly not a medical physician, so none of this is medical advice, <laughs> but uh, certainly it's, it's, it's good to go see your doctor if you have abnormal growths on your hands after, or sores after handling your fish. Uh, and, and if they prescribe an antibiotic, take the whole course of antibiotics, okay? So, but uh, yeah, usually it's not a big deal in, in humans, um, but, but certainly people who have chronic diseases and those kind of things that are immunocompetent, it, it, it can be a, a big issue. But typically it's, it's more just a, a skin infection. Yes, sir? Yeah, it certainly raises a, the question to, to make sure that people are cognizant of that and, um, you know, what they're doing. Again, it, 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 it's, uh, I don't want to give medical advice, but it's certainly something to be aware of and to have that conversation, um, you know, what that risk benefit is for individuals in that situation. Yeah. Okay, moving on to viral diseases. This is what I love about fish health. <clears throat> Channel catfish virus, what do you think it does? Facts channel catfish. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but it also does hybrids and blues, so it's not, you know, they name this off of channels, but then the hybrids and blues uh, have that. So it's a herpes virus. What does that mean? That means it's for life, okay? It's never going to go away. You're always going to have it. 
Uh, again, this is primarily an issue in the cultured catfish, although you can find it in wild catfish as well. Typically, we only see an issue here in young fish. So if you've got uh, a hatch house or, or young uh, catfish fingerlings and you have high mortality, um, certainly something to consider, and especially if the fish looks like this fish where you have that exophthalmia uh, and that ascites down here. So um, this is a very common disease that we encounter in the catfish industry. What do you do about it? You don't do anything about it. Okay? There's not an antiviral drug that you can give. Um, and actually, if you go out and you test the catfish, uh, most catfish are probably going to be positive for this virus based on molecular tests. But again, it doesn't usually cause a problem except for in the small fish. How we diagnose it is we take those kidneys and those spleens and all those other internal organs that we looked at this morning and we put it on cell lines and uh, on, on basically a petri dish that has uh, cells growing on it. You put that homogenate, that mixture of the, of the internal organs, and you put it on there and you see all this you, I know you may not uh, have experience looking at cell lines, but hopefully you can appreciate that looks kind of nasty. Okay, and that's cell death because of the virus. It's killing the disease. It's killing the cells. The virus is killing the cells that are in there. Again, this is a vertical transmission, so a gift from the parents that keeps on giving. Uh, infectious hematopoietic necrosis virus. Okay, so remember i think we talked about this in both lab groups um homatopoietic what did i say that was a term for wow okay i don't know if i said that maybe <laughs> maybe i didn't homatopoietic remember we talked about there's no bone marrow in fish right and so their blood cells are made in the kidney and the spleen and the fancy term for blood cell generation is homatopoiesis okay so infectious homatopoietic necrosis virus it's an infectious virus. It causes necrosis or death of the hematopoietic tissue. So what do you get when you don't have any blood cells? You get anemia. What does that mean? What do you look at when you see your fish? You see pale gills because there's no blood in the gills. Okay? Um, and you also see issues and changes in your kidney and in your spleen. So this goes back to you having some familiarity of being able to cut open your fish, look at the organs and say, hey, this doesn't look right, okay? This one uh, is both horizontal and vertical transmission, meaning that the parents can give it to the offspring and then the offspring share the love once they have it to their siblings. All right, infectious pancreatic necrosis virus. What tissue do you think this impacts? The pancreas, yes, see, look at this. I went to vet school for four years, I didn't need to do it, you guys have it all, right? So the problem becomes is in some fish, and in these fish, the, pancre the pancreatic tissue isn't... Did anyone find the pancreas when they were doing their necropsies? I'm seeing a lot of blank faces and shoulder shrugs, which is good because it's not a discrete organ, okay, in this fish. So you wouldn't necessarily... It's not easy to find. Those cells are usually in with the, the liver cells. And some, it depends upon the fish species. It could be in liver cells. It could be so... Typically, we use... Hum, um, uh, uh, hepatopancreas is, is more the, the more appropriate term, but basically what you see here is some of the pancreatic tissue is around those pyloric cica and the salmonids, and so you see some hemorrhage and those red dots all over the place um, indicative of that. So the problem with IPN is it could be subclinical, meaning you don't see any signs at all and very little mortality, to upwards of 100% mortality in your population, meaning that uh, the survivors of an infection can continue to carry that virus, and then at any point in time, typically after they're stressed, say, hey, you know what, I'll give it to you and, and share that virus. And they're debating about vertical transmission. We're not going to get into that. Uh, anyone here raising salmon? Okay, infectious salmon anemia, right, causes anemia in salmon, all right? Uh, high mortality, and basically, I put this in here, I, I didn't think anyone was probably raising uh, salmon, but this is a, this is a great uh, example of a disease that basically decimated the Chilean salmon industry. They were, they were probably one of the top producers, um, and back in 07, 08, we're talking thousands, if not tens of thousands of people lost their jobs because of this virus. It came in and, and really decimated that industry down there. Hopefully you guys have heard about this. This is uh, definitely a, a viral disease that's impacting uh, the Midwest, <clears throat> VHS, or viral hemorrhagic septicemia. Okay, it's septicemia. It's spread throughout. It's hemorrhagic, so it causes hemorrhage, meaning blood. 
So hopefully you can appreciate all these, this hemorrhage, all this redness in the fillets and throughout the, uh, the visceral uh, internal organs. So you see a bunch of, uh, bunch of hemorrhage. There's a very, very wide host range in this. Again, major impact in the Midwest. This shut down a lot of the fish movement here in the Midwest. Um, and still impacts it today. So this is a very important um, viral pathogen. If you're shipping fish across state lines, you're probably having to test your fish uh, for VHS. Spring viremia of carp. Again, another uh, very important pathogen. I put this in here because it's OIE reportable. Uh, OIE is the, the basically the, the um, World Organization of, of Animal Health. Um, and, and USDA APHIS, so here in the United States, they have an eradication program for this. Uh, so if you're raising carp, uh, I don't know if anyone is, but uh, this is definitely a, a pathogen that you're going to have to get tested for um, for that. Largemouth bass. So we talked a little bit about this in, uh, this morning, I think, with some folks that were talking about largemouth bass. Um, largemouth bass virus. I don't know. It's kind of hard to tell from the picture here, but can anyone think of what organ this might be? I heard it. Yep. Swim bladder. Okay, so this is the swim bladder, and we talked about swim bladder. This this virus has a predilection, or it likes to go to the swim bladder into the gas gland, and so uh, this this brownish stuff is brownish fluid inside the swim bladder, and, and causes an issue. So, uh, if you've got a largemouth bass that's dying, uh, this is definitely something from a diagnostic standpoint. They're going to want to sample uh, the swim bladder and gas gland, uh, and this is probably one that you're going to get tested for. Uh, when you when you uh, need to send your fish across state lines, something you need to test for. And again, it's really difficult because what does it look like externally? Well, it looks like any of the other diseases where you may see some hemorrhage in the facial area, you may see some sores and hemorrhage under the skin. It, it, it's difficult because these signs that you see with the different diseases, um, they, they're not too uh, specific to a specific pathogen. All right, parasites. So for those of you in uh, the doing catfish, uh, proliferative gill disease, Hanagaya ictiluri, the producer would come up and say, I got hamburger, hamburger gill, because apparently that looks like raw hamburger meat to people. Um, it's a parasite that, uh, this is one of the most prevalent parasites in the catfish industry today. Uh, it really leads to a lot of mortality. There's no treatment for it. So what they do is they look for the load of the parasite in the pond. And when that load goes down is when they use that to make stocking decisions and, and, and add more fish to the pond. They don't add more fish um, when they're having an active outbreak. This is one that's really easy to diagnose based on your gill, cl or your, sorry, your, uh, your gill biopsy. So that wet mount like you did today where you took your gills and you put it on a, on a slide with some water and you see this dark stuff, which is the cartilage, and you'll see these cartilage breaks. And that's because the parasite actually eats the cartilage. So this is something that your gill clips can make a diagnosis of the disease. Uh, again, one of the areas that uh, reasons why we always do gill clips and skin scrapes. So Balbophorus damnificus, this is a trematode parasite. So it's spread in the American white pelican and then the ram's horn snail on the pond. A lot of producers would like to um, kill the American white pelicans and scare them away from their ponds, but they're a protected bird, so you can't do that. But uh, basically, the adult parasite lives in the, in the bird, sheds these eggs, it goes into the snail that's in the pond, and then this little guy forms under the skin as all these little white dots. So you see these bumps. So a lot of people say, my fish have the bumps, and we'll get to some pictures later of some, some trematodes that you guys probably uh, may have experienced in your fish, particularly if you do pond-raised uh, pond fish. Significant economic losses in the catfish industry. Um, and mortality can be really severe even if you uh, have a small infestation. So I talked a little bit with someone earlier today about uh, whirling disease or Myxobolus cerebralis. Uh, this is a parasite that infects salmonids on the Pacific Northwest where I am. This is a huge issue uh, and one where they, it dictates a lot of the fish stocking. So you never move whirling disease positive, uh, fish from whirling disease positive waterways or watersheds to whirling disease negative watersheds. This parasite's really interesting because what it does is it eats the cartilage that supports the brain, okay? And so the fish starts swimming in a whirling pattern, hence whirling disease. And you can also see these really characteristic dark tails because of that neurologic sign and that damage that it causes. What's really cool is that, uh, well, cool to me because I do fish health stuff, is uh, the parasite, if it infects the young fish, you're going to see these clinical signs. If it impacts the 
older fish, you see no clinical signs at all because the cartilage has already converted to bone. And the parasite doesn't eat the bone, it only eats the cartilage. So you can, you can spread that disease if the fish was, was infected when it was an adult versus uh, when, it was, when it was young. You don't, when it's young, you're going to see these kind of signs. You're going to know something's wrong. Hopefully you recognize that's abnormal, right? Um, but if, if the, the fish can still be in, impacted and not look like that. Okay, so this is one too that um, all of you in the room, I don't care what species you're raising, this is something that you need to worry about. Okay, and this is something, again, that you can look on for a uh, skin scrape or a gill clip. Anyone want to take a stab at the name of this parasite? Yeah. Ick. Ick, yeah, okay. Touche, took the easy way out. Ick or white spot. So this looks like, if you have a fish, that looks like someone put salt on it. Okay, that's what ick is. It's ichthyopterius multifilius. Uh, is it, and so when you look at your... your your skin scraper or gill clip, you'll find a round uh, parasite that has, uh, it's hard to tell in this picture, and sometimes you can see it, sometimes you can't. Cilia are little hair-like projections all around the outside of it. It's filled with this dark material, and it has, uh, depending upon the orientation of the parasite, you can see what we call a C-shaped macronucleus, horseshoe nucleus, or horseshoe white, um, a crescent moon, uh, any different ways you want, to, uh, you want to describe that. The kicker is, this is also ick, and you don't see that C-shaped macronucleus. So recognize the orientation of the parasite matters. You may not always see that. This is very, very problematic in any fish species, freshwater fish species, and they also have a little cousin that impacts the saltwater fish species. So if you have some saltwater fish, um, this can be an issue as well. The problem with this parasite is that the treatment is only effective for one part of the life cycle. So multiple treatments are needed. Um, when we get ick at, at our facility, uh, we have to do multiple treatments in a week and typically for several weeks to, to make sure that we get all the different, uh, uh, the, as, the, as it goes through that life cycle, depending upon the timing of it, you only get one, one shot. You know, you're only hitting one part of the life cycle. So you've got to wait until the, the rest of the parasites get around to that, that part in the life cycle for you to be able to kill it. Okay, this is one that, uh, I'm sorry, yep. Yeah, <laughs> what do you treat it with? That's uh, an excellent question. Uh, you can use a lot of different things. Um, Parasite S, which is labeled in the United States, and that's in that guide that I was talking about. Uh, it's a formaldehyde product. It's labeled for that, that disease. So it's just a bath treatment, uh, or you know, we use a, a drip in our flow-through systems that you can uh, treat it with. But again, it, it only kills one part of that life stage. Yeah. Um, Okay, heterosporous, again, if you're, I think Bill was saying yesterday that when he sends fish up to Michigan, this is one of the ones that uh, instead of doing 60 fish to, to send out for a lot inspection, he has to do 120 fish for that. This is a, a parasite that infects the muscle cells, uh, particularly of these pathogens that you see, or sorry, these fish species that you see here. And basically what it causes is freezer burn. If you cut open your fish and you see freezer burn in the fillet and the fish wasn't frozen, Something's wrong, right? So this causes, uh, causes those different lesions, and that's a pretty characteristic sign for the fish. But uh, I think Bill was saying he has to send in the whole fish and do 120 of those for each lot that he wants to send up, up to Michigan. So this is definitely uh, an issue with uh, the parasitic that, that has a problem here in, in, the, in the Midwest. Okay, proliferative kidney disease. Again, this is going back to salmonids. Um, this was, I put this in here because I don't know if you've heard back in, I think it was a couple of years ago now, that it happened again more recently where they shut down the entire Yellowstone River. Um, that was because of this tetracapsuloides uh, parasite. So basically, hopefully you can appreciate, again, this is, so this is, we'll review anatomy real quick. This is the heart, the liver. Uh, this white stuff is visceral fat and GI. That's the spleen. This is all the kidney. And hopefully you can appreciate that kidney is bulging. And so it's swollen, and there's white areas in there, right? And so that's the, the, uh, the parasite that is causing proliferation or additional cells in there. Um, and again, this causes uh, more chronic mortality. Uh, it happens over time. It's not like you see a bunch, of, a bunch of dead fish at once. Okay, so remember I promised that we'll get to those parasites. We talked about Bobophorus and, and the trematodes. Here's a list of all the grubs and their fancy names of uh, what you see. If you have farmed uh, pond-reared fish, you've probably seen this before. Unfortunately, the perch that we cut open today 
didn't have it. Usually they do, so uh, I was kind of disappointed that they, they didn't have it. But this is what they present, and this is what they look like. It's grubs. It's, it, they're all trematodes, meaning they, the adult lives in a bird, and there's um, some other sort of indirect host, usually a, a, within a snail. And so you can see a fish that's absolutely covered here with, with, with black grubs, right, versus yellow grubs. Right, and really simple names depending upon the color of the fish, right? And so these are parasites. Uh, if you cook the fish, no problem for the folks you sell the fish to. Uh, although I'm not sure someone's going to pay you uh, for that fish if it looks like that, right? If you're selling the whole fish. So it is a problem from a, a, an aesthetic standpoint, but not a, a human health concern. Steve? Yes, sir? Longevity, is there, even if it's a fairly young largemouth bass that gets them, and it's another year and a half before they hit the market. But most likely, they're still going to live and feed off that animal and still be there. So there's not a, if you're selling a live food fish to an Asian market, it's not just a matter of, it looks ugly now, but if I hold it for X number of months, it's going to eventually dissolve into its skin and go away. Because you mentioned it's not a human health concern, but obviously no one wants to buy it. Right. Yeah. So, so for the recording, the, the question is, is, is if the if the fish have this uh, over time, does it go away, and then therefore it's not an aesthetics problem because it's not a human health concern to begin with. Um, we see that a lot with Bulbophorus, the Amnificus, down with catfish. We can actually, uh, once they get over that hump of of mortality initially, they'll actually go away. Um, but uh, like a fish like this in this picture, those those grubs probably aren't all going to go away. So you see that. I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily. Um, go in and call or depopulate your, your fish if they have that. The tricky part becomes is how long does it take for them to go away and how long are you willing to hold on to them uh, and continue to feed them. So uh, I would not be confident that they would necessarily all go away. Yeah. I, I've had this, the exact question was, largemouth bass, half the grubs, are yeah. eventually going to die. I need to sell them. Yeah, I mean, um, if you see grubs in your fish and they're at a level that you can sell the fish, uh, and again, you know, I mean, it's different if you're going pond stocking, and you don't necessarily want to sell the product to a customer that you know is going to be poor, or sub, you know, subpar. Um, but, but if it's a food fish, uh, you know, I would probably harvest it sooner rather than later. Okay, fungal diseases. So. Um, Again, we didn't really see any of these uh, fungus today. Usually with fungal diseases, a lot of people, uh, if you hear of winter kill, you'll usually see this uh, in the winter time or, or early, early spring time. And a lot of that has to do with uh, the cold temperatures. It decreases the, the mucus secretion, and so um, the, the fungus can get on there. Basically, uh, this is a picture of, of, of uh, branchiomycosis in, in the gills, obviously. When you do your wet mounts, you can see the fungus actually on the gills. And then if you do a skin scrape or something like that, you can see these fungal hyphae. Again, not usually an issue if you see this. Uh, it could be because, it's most commonly because of some other sort of issue. There was something underlying that caused a problem. And then the fungus said, hey, this is great. I'm going to go here and get some free food, i.e. your fish. OK, so thank you for sticking with me through all of those diseases. Uh, in summary, again, this is only a very, very select list. This, the fish diseases, I've given days-long lectures on fish diseases. So um, very select list. Uh, suffice it to say, infectious diseases do impact the culture in, in U.S. food fish. It's probably one of the largest impediments we have um, beyond regulatory issues. There's so, still so much more to learn to learn about these pathogens. A lot of research is going on right now. And again, I can't emphasize biosecurity, um, disease prevention, treatment control. This is really the importance of it. This is what, when Matt was talking about biosecurity, this is why you want to have it, so you don't have to deal with this. Okay, and again, this talk was just on infectious diseases. I didn't even touch on non-infectious diseases in, in husbandry. And I will say most of the infectious diseases we deal with, again, those pathogens are ubiquitous in the environment. The only time the disease manifests is when the fish are stressed. And the fish are usually stressed because we did something to them, right? So, okay, with that, uh, I don't know, hopefully I'm on time, close to it, I guess. Um, if you have any questions about the diseases specifically, and then I think because after that we're going to get some folks up and we'll have a Q&A session.